Panza. Here. Danielle Drove. Here. Dr. Bruce Fletcher. Beth Mankey got back. Here. Richard Carrier. Amy Parada. Here. Tim Sharp. Here. Jessica Weaver. Here. Uh, we will now move on to our second um, agenda point this evening, which is the presentation of award and proclamations. I will turn it over to Dr. Brummett for our presentation of the Everyday Hero Award. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Hutt Wagner. Uh, our, our Everyday Heroes this evening have let me know they're participating online. So I believe many of them are on the line already. But our everyday heroes tonight are from John Patterson School, Michelle Burba, Jill Hinton, Stacy Michaud, Daniela Ospina, and Jamie Throw. These are staff members of John Patterson School. And a little about a month and a half ago, there was a very significant episode at the school in which uh, a parent was having a challenging time. And these staff members went far above and beyond the call of duty. The, the parent had be, received some upsetting news, and it was at the tail end of the school day. And this entire team stopped everything, went to support the parent. There was some medical concerns, and they stayed with this family. There was a parent and a child. They stayed with this family for hours. And it was just a real show of doing what's right for our families even when it meant their school day got several hours longer. So uh, they were nominated by Principal Mike Gatos. And uh, I was very impressed when I heard, and I'm a little skinny on the details to protect confidentiality, but I, can, I want the board to know that this team of individuals uh, rose to the occasion and really turned the situation around and got the family the support that they needed. So. I will turn it back over to you. I believe uh, I did notice online. I know Jill Hinton is here online. Uh, let me see who else I saw on the call. Are they on? And Mike Very good. So were you going to reserve comments till the end, Ms. Hutt-Wagner? Yep. So we, um, we are going to reserve board comments until the end of our awards and um, proclamations um, item B on our agenda tonight. But I would like to open if... Um, any of those members of Receiving Everyday Hero would like to make a comment this evening, um, please, please do. And the certificate's on its way to John Patterson. <laughs> Hi, this is Stacey Michaud. I just want to um, thank Mike Gatos for nominating us and Dr. Brummett and the board for this recognition. Um, again, it, it was one of those times where the time of day didn't matter. Um, it was just important to be a support for the family, but we do appreciate being given this honor. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, we will move on to our next um, award for this evening, um, a, a yearly tradition, which is the holiday card contest winners. Um, and I will, um, let Dr. Brummett speak a little bit about the contest. And we have so many of our kiddos here tonight, and we're just so excited to congratulate you on your beautiful um, display of art. What I will do at first is display our holiday card contest winners, and then I'll invite um, those of you that are in attendance tonight up to receive your certificate, as well as a collection of... I've, made cards for all of your family so you have 10 cards that have your design on it that you can send out to the relatives and some of them i think are here tonight so it's kind of cool and by the way these cards are already going through the airwaves i've used them already to send out to some of my administrative colleagues uh the board now all has cards in front of them tonight um and i'll be sending some to town representatives uh mayor etc so the cards are going to go through the airwaves broadly your child's name is on them but not their last name 
So first, our first award winner is Theo Eisman, and I'm going to put his winning drawing up there. Theo is a student at John Patterson. All right. So Theo came right up, so we'll give him his. He's excited. Is this? Yeah. Okay. So All we're right. in there. So Theo, you are in first grade at John Patterson. This is pretty pretty exciting, and Mr. Uh, Gatos is on on the call as well. Do you want to see what your card looks like? So this is Theo's card. Everybody, it's also displayed. And congratulations, Theo. This is a beautiful, beautiful piece of artwork. Thank you so much. Congratulations. This is a special certificate for you. Get to bring that home. Here's you your card. There's 10 cards in there for your family. Take a picture with her. Right 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 right. Nice and proud. Okay. 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 Great there. Very nice. First grade, and he's already making beautiful artwork. All right, our next award winner is Aviana Figat. And did I say that correctly, Aviana? If not, come on up and correct me, please. Names are important to us. There she is. Aviana is, her artwork's on the board right now. And look at that, Joy. She is a second grade student at Ruth Chafee. And look at that beautiful artwork. Do you see it's on the big board, honey? Look at that. <laughs> oh yeah, paparazzi, my apologies. And these are your cards to bring home and share with your family and friends. Beautiful Congratulations to Aviana. <laughs> oh, nice, nice. I, I will tell you, I had a lot of entries. It was hard, but you can see these award winners are very, very talented. So proud of you. Way to go, Avi. Our next award winner is an E Green student. Her name is Hazel Joseph, and she is in kindergarten. Look at that artwork for kindergarten. Come on up, Hazel. Oh my goodness. Hazel, this is beautiful. I love it. So here's your oh, word. Do you want to smile and take a picture? This Dad's going to take your picture. Thank you. So we've got future artists on our hands here. Our next winner is Angela Vaca. Angela is, there she comes, very excited. She is a fourth grade student at Anna Reynolds, and I believe her card represented our equity efforts beautifully, looking at a bunch of holidays representative of our community. So her, her card was very noteworthy. Congratulations, Angela. Our next award winner is Seven Circo. Seven is a student in the middle school. And just wait till my, he is a fifth grader at Martin Kellogg. And I also thought his card had a beautiful message as did all the cards. Come on up, is Seven here tonight? He, she is not here. Uh, so we will make sure these cards get to her at Kellogg as well as her certificate. Well done. Our next winner is Madeline Tardif. Madeline is in middle school at John Wallace. And her design is slowly but surely going to come up. And look at that. What says holidays more than a cup of hot chocolate? Sorry, that's not, uh, she not here as well. Oh, you are Thanks. online, Madeline. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It does look really good. Okay. And last but not least, we have our winner from Newington High School. This is Fiona Gancy, and look at her artwork. Look at that. Beautiful. Congratulations. Beautiful work. So congratulations once again to our award winners. And I just did feel, because I had so many amazing designs, I did name some honorable mentions. They will get a certificate this evening. We have Elizabeth Green, Delilah, 
Odoro, is she here this evening? Delilah, come on up. I'll put your design on the on the board. A beautifully de decorated house. And Delilah is a fourth grader at E Green. Congratulations. Well done. Our next award winner is Samarth Swain. Samarth actually uh, was our winner last year too. Wow. And his design also was highly representative of our equity efforts. He is a grade four student at Anna Reynolds. And clearly, and look at look at Mr. Snowman. We are NPS. I love it with a little diploma uh, pin. It's very it's the same artist as last year. So this gentleman has a uh, a career ahead of him in an art design, perhaps Hallmark may be calling. All right, then we have our grade seven honorable mention, Ivana Mongru. Is she here this evening? There she is. And she also featured a lovely snowman and her, it's a little house in the background. Happy holiday. Congratulations. Beautifully done. And then our last award winner tonight, honorable mention is Lindsay Morgenthau. She is from Newington High School and she used her graphic art design class to design her card. It is going to come up any minute now. Look at that. <laughs> uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Isn't that neat? Happy holidays. And this is a graphic artist design. So. So I just want to once again thank the families for coming this evening and our students who participated. Like I said, I had a lot of entries. It was a very hard decision, but I'm very proud of our artists in the room and how hard they worked on these designs. And I hope you enjoy your cards and, you know, bragging rights. So thank you again. You're welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting, but uh, you may have other things to do this evening. So we'll, we'll let you decide that. The kids may need to go to bed. Uh, after all that hard work on this artwork. So I will turn it back over to you, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you. I will also now open up to um, any board members that would like to comment on our awards and proclamations this evening. And there will be commentary parents if you want to stay a little while longer. Oh, I guess they're out. Yeah, we'll Thank you guys. Thank you very much. Congratulations. All right. Uh, so I just want to um, say thank you to uh, everyone for coming out because that was really nice to just everyone in person i think last year we did it and it was all kind of virtual and i was just remarking to wendy about how my like cousin-in-law got one last year and it was just it's so great to see the art so first want to say um a huge thank you and congratulations to our everyday hero award winners um i think we've had a, a lot of different crises this year um and to have a team um in place to respond to um these crises that unfortunately happen every day, um, but that we never want to see is really important. So um, kudos to our team for being able to step in um, in the every day that is not necessarily in the classroom. And uh, and congratulations to all. And if Madeline's still online, or, uh, just so you know, I have your card and it's gorgeous. Um, and I just really appreciate all the effort that not only goes in by the students, um, we love to see their talent. I think it's just a great thing for our community, but also uh, thanks to Dr. Brummett for kind of spearheading this initiative. I know it's probably incredibly tough to to pick these, but I think it just um, reflects a great part of our schools that not just in the academics, but in the arts, um, we really have so much talent. So thank you and congratulations. Yeah, I just, um, I want to, um, I do want to say that I really love the cards that uh, that we got and um, Dr. Brummett did point out uh, quite aptly that there is that, that a couple of these cards really do uh, encompass what we established as goals for equity and inclusion. We have we have Hanukkah, we have Christmas, we have other symbols that I don't even know what they are, but the, but that you know it, it is it's it's a very festive and I love it and it just makes me smile. Great job, kids. 
Yes, I will just echo. I think all the artwork is is gorgeous and um, everyone did a wonderful job. And to our everyday heroes, you know, I know a lot of you have families at home. So just thank you for being there for that family. I think it, it means a lot. So we're lucky to have you. Thank you. To our everyday heroes, thank you. I'm not going to keep repeating, but they all said it. And I love the fact that we have the opportunity with the cards to give children another outlet besides just academics. Everyone has strengths in lots of different ways. So I love the fact that we honor this. And I just think it's a great tradition that you started, Ms. Uh, Dr. Brumman. Thank you. Um, so I'll use this one. It's gone. Um, yeah, so to the everyday heroes at Patterson, um, I'm lucky enough that both of my kids went or are going to Patterson. I obviously know some of the people who were awarded today. And I think, you know, obviously going above and beyond in that moment is just one moment. I think them being everyday heroes, um, the, the award encompasses what they truly do each and every day. Um, and I think just, you know, obviously to what Ms. Parati mentioned that they have families and, you know, they set their whatever their personal needs were for the evening aside for that family. And I think that it's probably just one instance of many others that they've done similar situations. So thank you to to all of them for that. And then uh, for the artwork. Yeah, I, I think it's awesome. I think it's such a it's such a great project for our kids to do in all the grades. I love that each school gets to participate individually. Um, I've seen the flyer come home. I've seen how serious my own kids who are not very artistic at times take it. Um, it's something that I think people look forward to and I think it's just an awesome addition and, and the artwork really shows that kids take it seriously and, and want to be a part of uh, spreading that holiday cheer. So thank you for starting it and thank you to all the students and the parents who participated. Mine too. Um, yeah, I want to say thank you to the Everyday Heroes. I wasn't here for the presentation, but, you know, I'm pretty sure, you know, every meeting, you know, I love that, you know, this school district recognizes our heroes and the things that they do. Um, also, thank you um, to all the children who participated, who were awarded and not awarded in this contest. I mean, these cards are amazing. They look almost professional. So thank you for all you do. And I can't wait till next year's contest. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Sharma. Hey, I quickly want to thank um, the Everyday Heroes and also all the students for the beautiful cards. So great job. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we are going to now move on to our public participation on any matter related to board responsibilities. Our civil participation is limited to three minutes. And just a reminder that um, board members do not... Um, at this time respond to our civil um, participation, but uh, welcome it. So if there's anybody online, I will look for some hands or if there's anybody in the room that would like to come forward. Okay. Um, good evening. Um, my name is Nancy Capello. Um, um, I live in 66 Pepper Bush Lane. First off, I want to thank all of you guys for all that you do. The Board of Ag Superintendent, you guys do so much, and I know it's volunteer for most of you. Um, I'm standing here tonight because I want to voice my thoughts on what I've seen happen the past two years during the pandemic. And I'm only saying this because I see um, other states taking some lead on this, and I just don't want this to happen to our state. Um, the unnecessary shutdowns and closings of schools affected every single child in a negative way. At the time of COVID-19 was unknown and it was a bit scary. We looked to our leaders for help and we trusted that they had our best interest at hand. So we listened. We kept our kids home and we helped them with online schooling, which had proven to be a huge failure and detrimental to them. When they finally went back to school, we put them in masks and socially distanced them. We made them wear these masks while they even played sports, even outside. Even after the mask mandate was lifted for everyone else, our children had to continue wearing them, again, because our leaders mandated it. At the time when I, at this time, as time went on, I became very concerned that all the mandates were more about politics than keeping us safe. 
After all, big government gave tons of money to all the schools, so it made it easier to mandate. I want to address the fact that other states are going back into putting some masks on the kids, recommending or mandating. I want parents to know that that's the type of masks that we were putting on our children during the lockdowns only caused them harm. They do not keep anyone safe from COVID-19 virus. Unless you have a fitted N95 mask, the typical cloth or surgical mask does not work against the virus. The truth, the truth is covering your child's face and mouth weakens their immune system. Therefore, it shows that mandating it was, should only be optional. Besides not working for the COVID-19 virus, the masks have caused anxiety and depression amongst our youngest population. It's been over two years now, and we finally have the data that backs up everything that I've said. With all the mandates that we have had, I ask you, did it help or did it cause harm? Having said all of this, I would like to ask the Board of Ed and the superintendent to think about what is best for our children. No more mandates. Our children have suffered enough. If we have learned anything from the past two years, it's the damage that mandates have caused everyone. Let's move forward and fight for our children. Masks and vaccines should be optional, not a mandate. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, are there any other members online or in the public that would like to speak this evening? Hi, good evening. Hi. I apologize for the hat. It was winter hat day at school and I figure uh, it's probably better to keep it on than take it off right now at this point. I'm Sarah Yeiser and I'm from East Robbins Avenue. Um, I'm here tonight because I'm concerned about the mask mandates coming back. Uh, one of our neighboring states that we seem to follow in their footsteps wants to make it mandatory again, and they're leaning towards their boards of education. You know, back in February, when the governor gave back control to the towns, I asked you to consider rewriting the opening plan to include parental choice. The reopening plans are meant to be revisited every six months with parent input up to September 30th, 2023, per the ARP Act and ESSER funding. There has been plenty of science, which I can share with you guys again, that says masks do not play a role in to the transmission of COVID, like preventing it. The science actually shows the opposite, that they're harmful, both mentally and physically. However, if people want to mask their child again, that's their choice. Um, I attended a town meeting the other night and I was actually kind of surprised they have a whole section after public participation that the people respond back to them. And I'm just kind of wondering why the Board of Ed doesn't do this. Uh, not everyone has to agree with what's being said, but there was just a huge validation felt by all that spoke that they were actually heard. Which leads me to how I'm trying to make sense of the public complaint policy changes that you guys are going to discuss later. And I thought the November 30th meeting that I attended, members got a little defensive and stated that these changes were for book selection. But it appears that the header of this policy says community relations and public complaint. And the changes here are taking away the voice of the parent. And I'm all for structure and a chain of command because I can only assume that you guys get inundated with emails but there are very few parents that actually come and speak at these meetings. And I just can't help but to think that it's some sort of punishment for that. Uh, boards of education have committees and I feel if the topics that are discussed fall under those committees, I don't really see why it can't be discussed in a public setting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, like online, we do have, um, oh, sorry. Um, it looks like online we do have um, Melissa Tolzano, so I will call on you now to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> my name is Melissa Tolzano, and I live on 8th Street. Um, so I've also read the public complaint verbiage and the agenda paperwork, um, and I'm, I'm kind of surprised by the fact that as, as elected officials, that you can sit on the board and sit in committee meetings creating policy and procedures to be carried out in our schools, yet com complaints can't be addressed directly towards you. And I do understand that the chain of commands, as well as what Sarah said, um, 
But if you are the people that are creating policies that we have issues with, um, I don't understand why that we can't even a- address you, not necessarily just verbally in a, um, in a board meeting, but even through email, if it has to be through email. I feel like a lot of this is taking our voice away in the fact that it, it, it kind of defeats the purpose of public comment, except for a public record, um, and that it, it seems that an email would be a best source of um, communication with whomever the complaint needs to be addressed with. Um, I also attended the town council meeting and and kind of want to mimic what Sarah said. And I, I really want to suggest that piece of it. I thought that it was a great part um, in the fact that after public comment that the council members and the mayor were allowed to address the constituents. And I, I feel like that may be an area that you guys can kind of forward through the chains of commands at that time, possibly, um, and address each person and state whom you're going to direct their concerns to so that the constituent can then follow through via email um, if need be. I also wanted to state that recently I removed my child from Newington Public Schools and placed her at a private school where her sister was already attending. And learning what they are learning is so far ahead of the Newington Public School second grade that I was absolutely blown away. Being exposed to both schools, the quality of the private school education was drastically different than that of public school. Their language arts curriculum is so much involving sentence structure, subject predicate, types of sentences declarative, exclamatory, um, spelling tests, editing, actual homework. Whereas in second grade at Anne Arundel, they had to read each evening and that was it. Their math is not common core. It's math the way we all learned math. They had already started money, whereas Anna Reynolds, they weren't planning on doing that till after Christmas break. They're doing three-digit addition, subtraction, double-digit numbers. Their core of their curriculum is not guys behind social-emotional learning, equity, and inclusion. It's actual learning of math, English, science, critical thinking, and more. And teachers can be creative in the expression of material teaching children how to think, not what to think. And the diversity is just as diverse, if not more, than the public school system. I I would really like to truly understand what they're trying to accomplish with our children, distracting us with these common words of equity and inclusion we hear so often. Um, And they use these words so fluently, yeah, what are they actually teaching our children with this method? I don't believe it's transparent. Um, I believe in one of the last Board of Ed meetings, it was stated that math scores have declined throughout the district. So instead of policy meetings and board meetings discussing criticism criticism made at council meetings, dress codes, why aren't, aren't there policies being created to improve these scores in math and catch these kids up that are behind from the pandemic? Why isn't this really about the children and their education? Instead, I feel like policy created is being made with personal interests in mind and not the best interests of the students. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public that would like to speak this evening? Okay. Thank you so much for speaking. We appreciate this offer. Okay, we are going to move to um, item D, which is the consent agenda. However, before we do that, I just wanted to mention um, that in efforts to run a orderly meeting um, and be respectful of everybody's time, um, I think it would be important that as board members, everybody gets a chance to speak first on a topic before Um, coming back to a person for a second time and that we ensure that our comments are succinct um, rather than repetitive and that we truly are able to express what we feel in a more succinct um, manner. hope that makes sense. Um, So on to our consent agenda um, from our November 16th, 2022 meeting, looking for approval of those minutes. Uh, Ms. Waver. The motion to approve the minutes of the November 16th, 2022 regular meeting. Thank you, Mr. Oz. I'll move to a roll call vote. A discussion, I'm sorry. Thank you. Is there discussion on this? Got a newbie up here. Yes, Mr. Laveria. Yes. Uh, okay. hey. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, pay, uh, page five, uh, number five, um, vote indicates motion passed six zero that Dr. Fletcher Laverrier and Yap abstained. Dr. Fletcher recused. It was not an abstention. So yeah, just putting that for proposed amendment. Uh, 
uh, I'm asking a question out loud here. Sorry, I apologize. But does he need to be there here to confirm or deny that, or can we just I, make I that? I would Grant. agree. I, he he did recuse himself because okay. the motion was specific to his role. Okay. So, so we will amend so. the minutes, and so therefore we would be motioning to approve the minutes with that amendment. Second. So we will first vote on the original minutes, then we will vote on the amendment to the minutes. We will vote this down. Okay. So, yes, we'll vote this down because it's part of the discussion. Let's do it. Sounds like fun. Board, yeah. Let's do it. No. Danielle Draw. No. That bag No. No. Thanks. Amy Parati. No. Irma. No. 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 I will now entertain a new motion. Thank you. Motion to accept the minutes with the amended version of Dr. Bruce Fletcher changing from abstained to re reduced. Second. Second. Thank you. We will now do a roll call vote on this motion. Michael Miranda. Yes. Danielle Drow. Yes. That's me. Yes. 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 Thank you. Moving on to item E on our agenda this evening is the superintendent of schools report. Um, an update to the agenda is that the update on equity, um, that item is going to be removed this evening um, because the data is still being collected from the surveys. That will be on the agenda for our January meeting with data in our presentation. Um, so I will now move to our update on the K through three reading programs and next steps. Dr. Brummett will be presenting. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to make sure the board was fully updated on the ongoing dilemma with K-3 reading legislation. Um, there was a law passed. It's one of those laws that kind of passed in the dead of night where the um, state wanted to require that districts submit how their curriculum is evidence-based focuses on competency and oral language. In other words, adheres to the science of reading oral language, phonemic awareness, fluency, vocabulary, uh, rapid automatic name or letter name fluency and reading comprehension. So that was legislation that went into effect in, in July. Uh, superintendents pretty nationally across the state of Connecticut believe the State Department of Ed overreached when they asked districts to submit their program components, they did not ask us for our curriculum. They only wanted us to say, what program do we use? The submit submissions did not allow districts to discuss supplemental materials that are being used. They conducted a very complicated evaluation process. I can speak to that personally because I was a program reviewer. Uh, it took me four hours to review one program. When the process was done, only seven programs were approved by the state and I'm going to show you those right now. And of these programs, they're, uh, they're the bulleted list. Uh, only 11 districts in the state of Connecticut currently use them. And of those 11 districts, many are not getting very good reading results. Uh, I saw some charts today about reading scores declining in many districts that are using these uh, programs. There has also been... Um, and uh, a secondary issue is several of these programs have been labeled as culturally insensitive or culturally inappropriate. So uh, the process, again, where districts had to um, submit this was not really what the legislation had in mind. And I've talked to many legislators, including our own local folks. Uh, it really was meant to be, do you adhere to the science of reading within your curriculum, which we do in Newington. I will also note that Newington does not use any of those seven programs. 
So what does this mean for us now? Uh, the State Department of Ed, and I would say about 60% of districts, if not more, in the state of Connecticut use what we use, which is the uh, Reader's Writer's Workshop model, units of study. There has now been, after much deliberation and debate, an opportunity for us to apply, not us, the entire state, to apply for a waiver. It is coming out on Thursday, finally, and it's due February 28th. We will be applying for the waiver. If our waiver is not approved, it could mean we need to adopt a new program. Um, one of the programs that is pending is called Schoolwide, which Newington year, used years ago, but decided not to use it anymore because we felt the program that we're currently using is better. Uh, we could use Schoolwide again, but we do believe our current program is, is better for our students. And as the board knows, right, right now our scores are above state average in the area of reading in the aggregate. Other considerations, as I mentioned earlier, of the 11 districts that are using the state approved programs, many of them, if not most of them, are not getting uh, above average results. Several of them have been deemed culturally inappropriate or insensitive. Adopting a new program would cost the Board of Education at least $500,000. Materials, training, um, not to mention morale on teachers who have spent the last uh, seven or eight years learning to do readers and writers workshop. We get ongoing training from um, Columbia. They send out trainers that, of course, we have to pay for. But we do have we have invested a lot of time, money, materials into this program. We believe our current model is superior to the state approved programs. So just so the board's fully aware, our program is very comprehensive. It aligns with Connecticut standards. It's provided to all of our primary students, which is K-3, in a workshop model. We do explicitly instruct kids through read-alouds, shared reading, partner reading, small group instruction, independent reading. Primary resources are utilized for each component of literacy instruction, so it's real materials that kids can relate to. The units of study do get at phonics, reading and writing, and phonemic awareness. And we use supplemental resources to support that because our belief is not one program is going to meet the needs of all children. And these are the, the components. I won't get into a lot of detail, but we have a word study block for 30 minutes, a reading block for 45 to 50 minutes, a writing block for 35 to 40 minutes, and read aloud. So this is every day, unless it's a shortened day, uh, then it's a short amount of time. But that's a pretty intensive amount of time that goes into reading and writing instruction. And just to confirm again, based on the state legislation, it does align with the science of reading, SOR abbreviated, comprehension, fluency, vocabulary, phonics, and phonemic awareness. We have all of that in our program. And students are learning language. They're learning different ways of uh, attacking words, segmenting, blending, manipulating sounds, multi-sensory. So it provides students with a lot of avenues to learn how to read. Uh, we teach phonics systematically and explicitly, and um, it's a hands-on approach. So there's a lot of direct instruction. And for those of you that don't know what a workshop model looks like, the teacher does a mini lesson and then pulls children aside for check-ins, conferencing, to make sure they've grasped the concepts. And then from there, teachers will develop groups that may need a little extra time. So it's a very systemic and systematic approach to reading. Um, it does get good results. And I think the boat that has been missed by the state is that there are no, there is not one program that's gonna reach all students. Hence, we do offer different strategies for kids who struggle in reading. We have a Wilson program that's geared for kids who have decoding issues, or we have Linda Mood Bell, and we have uh, other fluency programs so that we can give kids extra practice if they have a weakness in one of those core areas. So I just thought I'd leave that give the board an opportunity to answer questions. And I could not not mention that if you can read this slideshow, you should thank a teacher because they taught you how to read. Um, so I'll turn it back over to the chair to see if there are any questions from the board. Thank you, Ms. Yap. Um, can we have a copy of that presentation just so we can review it? Because I didn't see that in the packet. Yes. Um, <clears throat> and are there any state grants that could be applied to the $500,000 cost that we could? We are waiting to hear from the state. They've been closed mouth about grant uh, monies uh, for this program. So far, we have heard of none. Mr. Leverrier. 
Yes, thank you. Um, what was the, uh, you were showing the blocks, you know, there was a, a read aloud, there was a reading. What was the first block? I missed that on this on the slide. This slide? No, no, uh, I think it was one or two before that. Work, uh, word study block. What? Well, I can let our chair yeah. speak to it because yeah, I could, could, use we, the same curriculum maybe, or I have. In my other life. Yeah, um, as well. Yeah, so it's understanding, it's a, it's a new kind of take on um, spelling and understanding the meanings of words and also understanding how letters are put together, vowel sounds, um, like CH is a sound put, when letters are put together. It's a diagraph or SH, the schwa, which is a silent E, which is a very fun word to say, schwa. Um, Ms. Krause, do you want to add to that? Yeah, we just add the, if you think about a traditional phonics program, the word study block time in, in K1 and 2 is where that phonics instruction would take place. So they're learning how to break down words, as you said. Um, all of those, all of those um, blends and digraphs and all of those fun things are during that block. And then they um, apply what they learn in phonics instruct in, instruction during the reading and writing block. So that's where they're decoding words with what they learn and then encoding words and writing with what they learn. So it's a phonics instruction goes throughout all of the literacy blocks, but that's the uh, time for the explicit instruction. Um, I just wanted to inquire, are there other districts that are um, uh, in the same position, are feeling the same way that we are that also use this use the readers writers workshop model and are hesitant or, or have some concerns about adopting a new program that's not as as good as what we have going yes i can only tell you that this has been a topic of conversation uh, among superintendents uh, all school year and the vast majority of school districts in connecticut use this model and districts are rallying around it because we do feel it meets the science of reading uh, districts, the ones that are more willing to go along with this are districts that don't currently have a strong reading program or a reading curriculum that they follow. I've talked to those districts as well. Um, so they're they're kind of willing to go this route because they really don't have a pro program right now that they can rely on. Our goal with Wendy's help and um, assistance from actually Columbia because they're going to help us with the waiver is to prove and demonstrate that our current program is effective and there's a we, the waiver I saw a sneak preview of it today. It's extremely detailed, but uh, I believe we can successfully submit. And as long as the process is fair, that it would be that we would be successful in that. If not, we are also going to apply for an extension, so that will give us all of next year to not only determine what we will do, but then plan for it in the budget process. So right now, you will not see a reading program in our budget for next year because we will, um, ex the extension will be granted and hopefully the waiver will be granted as well. Um, so that is what we've been working on and with Wendy's support and, uh, for the past several months. Uh, Ms. Yap and Ms. Drews. Can you provide any details in regards to the school-wide um, program loans and how it compares to readers and workshops? I will turn that over to Wendy because it was here before me. Uh, yes, actually the, the school-wide program uses a workshop model as well. So it's similar to what Dr. Barmet was saying, there's a mini lesson and then opportunities for small group support. It was actually the writers of school wide had previously worked for the units of study program and had broken off to write something a little more explicit. Um, so it was almost our entry into the units of study. We did it for about three years before we adopted the units of study. Thank you. So very similar in, in structure and certainly with content because they're both aligned to the same standards. So the content ends up being very similar. Thank you. So along with this legislation, is this new that a, a legislation would say you have to have a prefabbed program? Because like, I mean, what if you just wanted to follow your curriculum and have everything teacher made? Yes, this is highly unusual for the state of Connecticut to mandate a program. We are mandated to follow a curriculum that meets state standards, but we've never been mandated to follow a program. Um, so this is highly unusual and very concerning to board, boards of ed as well as superintendents.
thing went off. The school-wide program is still under review. So the state kind of approved several out of the gate. They approved a few more. Originally, I think it was only five, now it's seven. And then school-wide and weather program are pending review. So that, that may still not be an accepted program, but we do, I have checked with Wendy, we do have a lot of those materials still with us. So if in fact that does get approved and we are unsuccessful in reader's workshop approval, we can kind of marry those programs and hopefully uh, not get into the exorbitant costs that, that many of my colleagues are facing. I have more questions for um, what, What's the reasoning? Uh, do, do you have any um, idea what the reasoning is behind changing the program that we already have that clearly works? Dr. Brummett might be better to answer that. She's been on the she's been on some of the committees that were with the inner workings. Um, but my the short answer is that at the state level, their reasoning is um, to ensure that all students have access to a high quality program. And where we look at it, that we want students to have access to a high quality curriculum, and we put our efforts into teachers being able to implement that curriculum and and being able to differentiate and meet different needs is really important. Um, before we had school-wide, we had um, Harcourt reading, which is more of a basal, more of a canned program, like kind of what you're seeing that incorporates everything. And it, it's a little bit harder to differentiate in programs like that. They are all inclusive. They very comprehensive programs, you know, so there's, there's certainly benefits to them. I think that might be what people are looking at, um, but there's so much more that goes into teaching reading than the program itself. Thank you. And I would agree with Wendy's uh, assertion, and I believe it, it centers around the fact that there are a lot of kids in the state of Connecticut that are not proficient readers, and legislators are very upset by that. So that no one's going to disagree with that, 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 that's unacceptable. Where I think they've missed the mark is that mandating a program is going to solve that. I think there's more to that thinking of getting everyone well-trained in the science of reading having opportunity to differentiate your instruction for kids that need a different approach. Because I was a special ed teacher before I became a superintendent. And, um, you know, I used v various reading programs depending on what my students' weak areas were. So it, there is not a one size fits all in reading. And reading is an extraordinarily com complicated process for, m for many kids, it really is. Are there any further uh, questions on this presentation. Okay. Okay, we are going to move on to our um, new business this evening, and that will be reports on standing um, committees. Our first report comes from the Student Policy Committee that held meetings on both November 9th and November 30th. We are actually going to forego saying anything right now because we have so much of the discussion at the bottom. So um, when we get to that, Mr. Farisi will take over, but we. Converse. That's what we discussed is the policy. What? <laughs> That's what our meetings were, the policies yeah, so, for. So we'll talk about it later. Okay, thank you. Um, if I could move now to the Finance Committee, which held its meeting on November 28th. Uh, Dr. Brummett, did you wanna just present what uh, myself and Bruce were talking about um, in regards to the Wallace Yes, and actually, yeah. fortuitously, we also have a capital presentation coming say, later on. in the agenda. And as Ms. Yap indicated, that was the thrust of our meeting uh, on the 28th. We discussed the capital plan. The subcommittee deliberated about different options, and you mm -hmm. will see those this evening through the capital presentation under a later agenda item. Okay. So, uh, and then the board did talk about as well grant writing, and Ms. Yap was going to follow up with me about a presentation that she was able to obtain. Um, and that was the crux of the meeting. And we talked a little bit about grant funded positions, which we will also share with the board during the budget process. Yes. Okay, so I will move on to facilities committee, which held a meeting on the 28th of November. That was a joint meeting. Yeah. Oh, okay, my apologies. I understand. Okay, so that <laughs> more to come. Um, and now on to our student representatives and their report for us this evening. Howdy, everybody. Um, so <laughs> I wanted to start with um, the music and arts. So as you guys know, um, our fall play, Christmas Carol, happened in November, and it was 
absolutely phenomenal. It was our most sold show ever in Ewington High School. And we're super proud of it. Like we outsold Clue last year, which was like mind boggling. Um, so very exciting stuff. And so in the spring, um, our musical, The Drowsy Chaperone is coming up and cast lists have been sent out for that as well. So rehearsals will start soon, soon which is exciting. And then Chamber Choir is having a trip to New York this weekend. So Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, which is super fun. And then tomorrow we have an orchestra concert going on as well. So lots of fun stuff around holiday time. And then for sports, winter sports are starting up. Um, ice hockey has a record of 2-1-3 and wrestling has a game tonight um, away at Glastonbury. Boys basketball has a game against Berlin tomorrow. At, um, and it's a home game too, so come and show your support. And um, Friday, there is an away game or away meet for um, the boys swim team. And then Friday and Saturday, indoor track is starting up at New Haven for their first meet at Hill House High School. So for our upcoming and past events, um, Monday night this week, student council at the high school held their first um, community service project for the year. And so we had a holiday movie night where we had students the week before during their homerooms vote for a movie that they wanted and the choice was Home Alone. So we had the movie played in the auditorium for Newington High School students, teachers and their families with free snacks and free hot chocolate and admission was just an unwrapped toy for Toys for Tots. We are still collecting until the end of the day tomorrow um, in the main office at the high school or if you go to the student council office, people can also drop their donations there. Also, tomorrow is our December theme Thursday, which is Ugly Sweater Day. And next week, Newington High School, along with many schools in the district, are having a Holiday Spirit Week. Now, the Holiday Spirit Days for the week vary depending on school, but it's just the main idea is to get students and staff excited about the upcoming winter break and boost morale as there are a lot of tests going on right now and projects because the second quarter is coming to a close. So we have that coming up. And then also student council is going to have a service committee field trip in January to the House of Bread. So students can help um, support a good cause and donate their time to help um, the homeless and less fortunate. And Again, student council, we are also looking because of homecoming was such a big hit this year and so was our original spirit week. That's why we're also having a holiday spirit week. And then I think in February or March, we're looking to do another dance, preferably decades week for spirit week. And it's going to be an 80s themed dance. So very exciting for students and for teachers who are willing to chaperone. For DECA, um, competition practices have started up and on Monday we had alumni come in to um, review our practice role plays for the competition and it's going very well. Like people are submitting practice tests and the practice um, role plays are going very well, which is super exciting because the competition is coming up and we have also had a very successful um, community service project. DECA teamed up with FBLA to do Dress for Success, so we um, Students um, donated either $5 or business casual clothing, and that clothing is going to go towards the Dress for Success um, chapter in Connecticut, but also some of the clothing will be staying at Newington High School for like people to use when co competing, going to job interviews, or like performing for like orchestra or chorale concerts. Um, Women in Leadership is having their annual drive for the Prudence Crandall Center, and we're collecting toiletries and gift cards at the high school for that as well. Um, and then a few things about honor societies. So National Honor Society finally got our parking spaces back and painting for that was very successful. Successful. Um, it's it's so it's like so nice, like in front of the tennis courts, like you can see all the painted squares and it's so personalized. Um, and I think that was like a very big morale boost. Like we even have like personal stickers that we put on our IDs so we can come in through the gym entrance and they're so cute. And I think everybody loves it and everybody's really happy about it. Um, we also had pajama day on the 9th and we raised money through that homerooms collected a dollar for each person who wanted to wear pajamas to school that day, um, which was super fun. We are also having another pajama day for Stuco. Um, 
this coming up week, but it's okay because everybody loves to wear pajamas. Um, and National Honor Society also had a pasta fundraiser where you could buy um, like pasta that was like in shapes of like sports and animals and all of these like other cute things. Um, and yeah, I just thought that was kind of cool. Um, Math Honor Society has also started up again. So students are getting the opportunity to join that. The Science Honor Society induction is tomorrow, and English Honor Society has um, teamed up with the elementary school to do pen pal letters, which is so adorable. Um, so it's um, letters that we'll be writing to students who work with teachers, and like they'll be working, the students in the elementary school and the teachers will be working together to write a letter back to the high school students. And I just think it's also like really cool for elementary students to see that like high school students are like getting excited to go to college and things like that and we also have a little secret santa where we do like it's like a secret santa but with books which is so fun because i love books um so yeah and then on um a new well not really a new club but it kind of died down last year crochet club is being started up again which i think is really neat because we don't have a lot of art clubs and um miss charmit who's the counselor at newington high school and a student mia golick um started that up again and they're making some progress like mia learned to crochet like last week and she already made a stuffed animal teddy bear so i think they're doing pretty good <laughs> but um yeah that's all i have for clubs and also, you as a board suggested we get some input from the other schools in the district as well. So we've reached out to the middle schools. We haven't heard back from John Wallace yet, but from Martin Kellogg, uh, we reached out to the student council president there, and they had their holiday box event, which is where classes decorate cardboard boxes and fill them with items like toiletries, non-perishable food items, and toys. And apparently the school has raised over 20 boxes full of needed items for human services which is fantastic. And then also the Kellogg Community Helpers Club back in November volunteered to decorate the VA hospital sidewalks with chalk, writing positive messages to thank veterans around Veterans Day. So that's what we have from Martin Kellogg. Oh. Um, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that was outstanding. I think I think too, um, it's so uplifting. I love how the, the theme that I'm hearing behind so many things you just mentioned was really giving back to the community and ensuring that Newington, Newington students are so well-rounded and have these experiences um, to get out there and try new things and do things for others. So thank you for reporting on that. I, I feel so uplifted and, and motivated after, inspired after hearing that. I will open up if there's any other board comments. Mr. Branda. Um, just two quick things. So I saw the painting of the spots. I was dropping my daughter off at futsal and I saw some, some people doing their spots and my daughter who's in middle school is like, Oh, that's awesome. How do those kids get to do that? I want to do that. I'm like, well, you better get your grades up because they, you don't just get painted spots just because, um, <laughs> So one thing that I wanted to ask you was, I know early on we talked about Stop the Stigma and, and talking about bringing it to the middle schools and, and having a presentation, but also finding ways to maybe, I hate to use the word recruit, but like create that pipeline of like eighth graders maybe so that they, when they get into high school, they kind of already know about the club. Has there been any progress on that yet to try and move that forward in the middle schools? Um, so we did make sure that after that meeting to talk to Stop the Stigma, we have our Stop the Stigma liaison. Her name's Julia Kaczynski. She's awesome. Um, they did say that they were going to be working with Ms. Redmond to reach out to the middle school, but I haven't heard any updates back from it since. But I can stop by tomorrow during my open just to make sure if like there was anything I missed that didn't get communicated. But I know that it was a really big thing for them and that they've been wanting to do it. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Also, one more thing, um, student council, we forgot to mention, the officers of the Newington High School Student Council took a field trip to Southern Connecticut State University for a state leadership conference. And there were several different workshops that we all participated in, um, some including college recruitment for athletics and just preparing for college, what to look for when scouting college, but most were centered around social emotional learning, mental health and ways to improve um, school and student involvement in the community and students involvement in the school. So we learned a lot from those presentations and are planning to incorporate that into our school and also send that information to the middle schools and elementary schools as well. 
Um, what can I say? Wow, you, your energy, like I just love your energy, just to let you know that. Um, so I thought that was awesome that you did the Toys for Tots um, for the high school, and I heard you say something about the Prudence Crandall collecting for them. Um, my question was, can anyone drop off an item and where? <laughs> just... um, yeah, of course. Um, so for the Prudence Crandall drive, um, there's like boxes in the main office and in every homeroom for collections. Um, so like I'm sure like if you came to Newington High School and like went to the main office, there's like a donation box there and it's the same for Toys for Tots. Um, we have one in the main office and then one in the Stucco office, but the Stucco office is kind of hard to find. <laughs> it's like it's like in the engineering wing with like near like the culinary department, but um, yeah, everything's in the main office and whenever is cool. Thank you. And my second question was, um, the Dress for Success program, so that's something that I actually used to donate to. They have like an office in Hartford um, that they help um, underprivileged, you know, people there. So is anyone in the public able to donate maybe new or gently used items? That is that something that? Um, so I know for, because I'm the chair of community service for DECA, so I was like leading the project on DECA's side. Our deadline for it has like, come in but i'm pretty sure fblas were extended and we haven't sorted through any of the clothing yet so if you drop off the clothing at the main office and ask for it to be sent to either room 201 or room 206 then we'd be able to collect the clothing and add it into our collection thank you i was a former fbla alumni so i love hearing about that thank you so much y'all move to the you have your own office what about the closet <laughs> <laughs> that was our office. It's the in-school suspension room now. Classic. Okay, I know you're Yeah, to. and um, and then we moved, we moved to the peer tutoring room, and then we moved from the peer tutoring room to the whiteboard room. Okay. And it's okay. actually kind of neat because like the tables are whiteboards and the walls are whiteboards, so I think we're very special in that. I just and was I was like, the yeah. closet was coveted. <laughs> <laughs> then we just had no room and I was like, I understand. Okay. Um, just want to say again, every time you guys come, it's just incredible. Uh, the comprehensiveness of this is c'est magnifique. Um, and I just wanted to say, I saw um, Miss Finelli post about the parking lot squares and I was like, oh my gosh, this looks like out of the Disney Channel. Like I loved it. I was like, my gosh, this looks like, I don't know, like something that we do at like PCA or something, right? Like I was just loving it. Um, but just wanted to say, uh, really proud of you guys for being able to come up with that. And thank you guys so much for reaching out to the other schools. I know it's already so much that you're covering at the high school. And then obviously we have a huge district of other ones. Uh, and good luck on fine on all your stuff this final week, I know. Uh, and I was actually just th thinking, I think Mr. Brenner and I are in the same one. I was going to ask just how the, um, we had asked this kind of probably a year ago around this time, just how mental health is around, how you feel, how um, kind of morale is among students. Um, you obviously are putting off all the good stuff, but feel free to let me know or let all of us know, I'm sorry, um, that, you know, how does it feel uh, right now? I know, you know, we're, still kind of in the midst of a lot of coming out of COVID, still in COVID. And I think it's just one of those things where we as a board would love to hear from you kind of how it feels. So um, if you want to speak to that, um, I know you have chamber trips, so that's obviously going to help. <laughs> yeah. Um, so obviously with like all the testing and big summative assessments right now, like, cause it's like crunch time right before break. And then we get back and we start preparing for midterms. Um, I think students are a little exhausted from that. And so it's nice that we have the break um, next week. And also we had a uh, half day this week. I know that teachers don't really get to leave early for that, <laughs> but the students appreciate it. Um, and so that's another reason why we're doing this holiday spirit week is to just try to get people more involved and excited to come to school because around this time, a lot of students, like they just, they don't have the motivation anymore. And we want students to continue to do well and to continue to enjoy school and feel safe there. So I think just getting through, like it's always been this way. Like I know my parents had like midterms and stuff right around the holidays too. So it's just, and even in college, I think students, it's just like one of those like trying times where it's like, this is like something you have to do, but I think they are able to 
prepare themselves for it. And I think with the help of like the holidays and the break being right there, it's helping get them through. And I think with like the added community service events and all the fundraisers and the spirit days, I think it's giving them something a little bit more to look forward to. So. Um, on the side of a senior, um, I think that everybody is like so glad that we have a break because like especially like even if, if you're applying early action or like regular decision, like it's like right now is the time where like everybody's like stressed about applications and like they're trying to keep their grades up and then there's all of these like big projects coming in and I know a lot of people are like very, very stressed out about it, but I think that the staff at Newington is they're just like so understanding of all of like at least like the teachers that i have like they understand a lot and it's very helpful for us like when like a teacher isn't yelling at you because you missed a deadline because like they understand what is going on and that like we have other commitments that we have to um like deal with especially like because i'm taking like a few ap classes and like my teachers know like it's not the only ap class that i'm taking and they take that into consideration um i think that having events at the school makes it more fun for everybody because it's something to look forward to when you're going to school because a lot of people are like oh i have to go to school today i have a history test today but i can wear pajamas but i can dress up like olaf and it's like kind of it's just like a positive side to it and um i do also want to say that i'm very thankful that here in newington we have like I don't know, like very good like counselors and social workers. Like I'm very glad that we have access to that kind of stuff because I know a lot of other schools don't. And like this year I've been realizing how helpful that is for me because like I'm like a, the kind of person who doesn't really like to reach out for help because I'm like, I can do it myself, it's fine. But like the other day, like my counselors, Ms. Sharma and Ms. Arnett, they're wonderful and they're so helpful and understanding. And it's great that students like have the ability to go to somebody and get a break if needed. And I think it's really nice because like I've like gotten a few of my friends who have been very stressed out to like actually like talk to a counselor and they come back from it and they're like, that was so like stress relieving. And I'm like, yeah, it's great. And it's like, these are like students who don't get those kind of opportunities because like their parents aren't telling them like, oh, like you could you have like these kind of options, but the fact that the school is giving it to them is very helpful. Thank you. Um, yeah, just no question, just comments on um, with regard to your uh, spirit week. I'm really glad that uh, that that you that everybody's working hard to make sure that morale is up at this time of year coming into the break. You know, it's, everybody's tired and I get that. Um, and I have to make my comments about the sports teams. I always do it. Um, really excited about uh, NHS hockey going out there to defend their uh, state championships. Go Nor'easters. And um, I'm really excited about girls basketball. There's there's a whole new team that's uh, Bella's like the, the star of the team right now. I'm very excited to see how that's going to go. So uh, good luck to the ladies basketball and to the and to the boys hockey. Uh, I'm excited to see how everything works out. Just quickly, I want to thank you so much. And Ms. Weaver's question about, you know, morale and everything I think was excellent to ask. And thank you for being so honest and open. And um, we appreciate you. And six more days, I think, left of school until break. So you can do it. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So thank you so much. And I hope everyone has a great holiday and new year. I just want to say thank you. You guys always do such a great job. Thank you. Thank you both. Really, that brightened everybody's day. Truly, truly. Um, I'm going to move on now under our new business to item one, which is the report um, concerning staff allocation for 2022-2023. And I'll turn that over to Mr. Farisi. Great. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, share with you this annual report uh, that's shared with the board um, each year. And it really ranges from October of last year to October of this year. And what we do is we look at um, what are the staff allocations uh, from that time span and how will that help to inform us for creating a budget and moving forward into next year. So the purpose of this is just to give you um, an idea, thank you so much, of the landscape of staffing right now. Um, and then when we get into our budget deliberations, we'll talk about what the projections of that will look like. So that way we can budget appropriately. Um, 
I would def uh, refer you probably to about the fourth paragraph down um, in what you'll see within the time frame from October of last year till now, or October of this year. Um, we had about 62 positions that we needed to fill. Uh, and during that time, uh, we had 41 certified staff um, and 21 non-certified staff um, of those uh, positions that needed to be filled. Um, most of the fills that we do uh, in both of those areas are uh, due to either resignations, retirements, uh, or transfers. Um, some people transfer from school to school. Um, so in the certified staff area, uh, there were 17 resignations, eight retirements, and six transfers, um, three leaves of absence, which were full years, so those will require long-term subs, and seven new positions. We had two at the high school, uh, for science teachers, we had one math coach at the elementary level. We had one special education teacher, uh, which was for a K-4 extension class. We had one four-year LTS uh, to cover uh, the K-4 other extension class when the person was on leave, uh, and one four-year LTS to cover an elementary teaching leave throughout the year. We also added a point two um, STEM position at the high school uh, to increase uh, our elective there and to be able to fulfill a requirement. Um, and among our non-certified staff, there were 10 resignations, 10 retirements, and one transfer. Um, I do think it important to share with the board, uh, when we see numbers around uh, resignations, and we do look at why are staff leaving. We do have a, a comprehensive exit survey. We do get most of our staff to complete it. Um, oftentimes, what we're finding in the data uh, is staff are either leaving to be closer to home um, so in a, a resident or a town that's, that's more nearby where they live, um, or sometimes they're in a position uh, where they want to switch and we might not have one available. Uh, we did find through the data that most often or most frequently that was in the area of special education. So they wanted to move out from that into something different. Um, so those would be the two highest areas of, of what we saw in the data on why people were resigning. Um, with that, uh, I would tell you that there was a projection of uh, 3,863 students uh, coming into this year. Um, we're a little higher than that right now. Um, as of October 1st, which is the report that we give to the state, uh, we were 3,913 students. Um, so that was definitely up in enrollment. Um, we were able to cover that enrollment difference with the staffing that we did have and projected for this year. Uh, so we were able to cover that just fine. The next few pages uh, show the exact data in highlighted fashion uh, on what I shared with you on what position changes occurred. Uh, and then the pages after that just show how many educators are in each program. So you're welcome to, to review that and look through that to see um, you know, how the numbers look. Following that, we get into class ratios. So you'll find a page, um, probably about four in, that'll say uh, per pupil staff ratio chart, and it shows kind of what our you know staffing ratio is per pupil ratio um, on average uh, at the different levels. Um, and you can kind of glean uh, what those ratios are. And then on the very next page, it shows in our elementary level what the exact numbers are in each classroom. And this is all data as of October 1st. This is what we report to the state. Um, that's a big reporting date to the state uh, Department of Education. And then if you flip the page, it goes into middle level um, numbers for uh, each classroom as well. We do look and we do project out and, and see where we might have what we call uh, a bubble where uh, grade level might be a little higher uh, than what we traditionally see uh, in some of the class sizes. Um, we do look to see how we can support that grade level uh, and make certain that we have appropriate class sizes so that way teachers can do what Mrs. Kraus and Dr. Brummett were sharing earlier, which is differentiate their instruction to meet the needs of all the students in that, that classroom. So we look at that very carefully and that will come up during budget time in the projections that we'll share and talk about. Uh, and equally, you'll see on the last page, uh, Newington High School and what the numbers are looking like there. So with all that, um, I would kind of pause and, and open this up to any questions that you might have. Ms. Yeah? Yeah. Sorry. Well, thank you. Um, so I'm looking at the 2022-23 class size report for Newington High School, and I just have a question. I know we have a, um, this is probably in 
meeting. Um, we have new developments that will be um, in Newington. And I'm looking at some of the class sizes that are in the 20s. Um, are we going to prepare for that? How, I mean, how do we plan on preparing for that? That's a great question. I appreciate that greatly. We started preparing for it last year. Uh, we are collaborating with the town um, and we were looking at um, and getting the figures on those developments when they would be going up, uh, when they would be finished and, and occupied, um, how many families potentially could be in there um, with children, you know, the amount of children, and then when those students would be in our schools and which schools they would be in. We have a full report on that. Uh, that'll be part of my projections that I will share. This report is um, taking last October to this October. Um, when our next meeting, I hope to be able to present to you then now the projections moving forward into next school year, and I will have all that information with me for that. Um, but we do have a report that covers all of that. I also have a question for Dr. Broman. Um, is Steve Frasey, and please correct me, is he allowed to come uh, attend even as just, you know, a non-voting member to our finance committee since this kind of would impact finance? I think that that would be something I would look forward to because this directly um, affects finance and we go over the budget. So if that's a possibility, I think it would help us with preparing for our budget. Yes, although the board as a whole will be deliberating the budget and he'll be a part of that. But if there is a particular agenda item that Mr. Friese could be responsive to, absolutely. He yeah, could especially be there. with the class yeah. sizes and you preparing that and then we present it to the board. I think that would be really helpful. I, I will attend any meeting. Um, I will share preliminarily um, that at this time uh, we wouldn't see a, a great difference um, in the earlier years of these projects going up, okay. uh, you know, building projects going up uh, for homes. Um, but but we can share all that and I'd be happy to attend any meeting to share. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Rose. I have a question for Mr. Farisi, please. Like Why is it that John Wallace eighth grade class sizes are so much bigger than all the rest of them? Do you have a reason for that? So what sometimes doesn't show in here in the difference is uh, we do have the academies at the eighth grade level. Um, so students do get dispersed out into the academies specifically for like science, mathematics, so different core areas. Um, so whereas they look big right here, uh, class size in general is not this big. Um, it's just that's the number that is in, in, in that grade level. So it projects as being larger. Um, so that's number one. Number two, we do get bubble years as I, I described. Um, and so we do look at the impact in totality and I work with the middle school principals very closely on that. Um, and if we did feel like that they weren't manageable after they were split up and into their academy classes as well, uh, we would look to add uh, extra teacher in those areas to make sure that we reduce sizes to more manageable instructional levels. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, I would now move us to our discussion and possible action um, on the establishment of dates for review of the superintendent's proposed 2023 uh, school year 24 budget. And I'll lead that, I'll send that over to Dr. Brummett. So I'm gonna pull up the um, recommended dates for our upcoming budget deliberations in this memo that was part of your packet, you will note that there are several dates set aside for the budget, Wednesday, February 1st at 7 p.m., Tuesday, February 7th at 6 p.m., and Wednesday, February 8th at 6 p.m. And each of those nights, we will review certain aspects of the budget, allow the board to have opportunity to ask questions, and you will receive a budget book ahead of those meetings, so you'll have the pleasure of a very large document arriving at your home for any type of pre-reading that you might want to do. But during the, the course of those evenings, I'll do an overview the first night and you'll hear my recommendations for what the budget would look like. And then I allow, obviously the board deliberates and then votes on a budget that becomes their own as, as the process progresses. So uh, the, then I, I, together with the, the board chair, will present to the town council at some point in March to discuss uh, 
you know, give them the opportunity to ask questions and make their own recommendations. So here is a schedule to be reviewed. Um, so February 1st, my overview. February 7th and 8th, we will go through all those departments that are on the chart that's currently displayed. No, it's not displayed. <clears throat> was displayed. I don't know why it stopped. Sorry. Right. Sure, where it's coming from. On the online. All right. So, um, seventh and eighth are those departmental discussions, and as needed, we can add February thirteenth, an additional night. If I could just ask that everybody that is um, with us virtually this evening, just please make sure that your microphone is muted. There's a lot of feedback -y type noise coming through and it's a little bit distracting for us. Thank you. And Deb, you can mute someone if you need to. So then no later than February 22nd, the board would need to adopt the budget. It becomes the board's budget at that point and it's transmitted to the town manager. And then, as I mentioned earlier, at some point in March, the exact date to be determined by the town council, the chair and I would present the board's budget to the town council. So I will turn it back over to the chair for the motion. Thank you. I'm up to Ms. Yap, Mr. Rose, and all others who wish to comment or question. Um, my question is, can we get a key code so we know what each of the numbers mean this year? That's the only thing I'm going to ask. So I know which schools... Oh, I, yes. Yeah, yes. yeah, that was hard for me last year. I'm like, wait, what is this? What number does this school correlate with? So if that's something that we could get, I would appreciate it. Yes. Ms. Jones, I have a question, and then when we go back around again, I have a second question. So my first question is, um, years ago, we, I know Saturdays are hard for everyone, but these budget meetings, like, go into, like, the wee hours of the night. And so one year we did, like, the seventh and eighth one, we did it on a Saturday and just kind of like got so it wasn't so late at night and we were all fresh. So I don't know if that's something that we're up for if it doesn't work, because I know a lot of you have families. Um, I have been in a different situation, so I don't know if it's something we want to think about. Uh, Miss Weaver, then I'll see if anybody else and then I'll go back and let everybody. Oops, sorry, Miss Weaver, and then I will go back and see if anybody wants to re comment. Yeah, we just address Ms. Joe's comments that uh, I believe town council would do the same. Uh, they'd come in like a Saturday morning and do that at times. Again, this was probably pre-pandemic. I'm not advocating this. I, I would love my Saturdays, but yeah, I mean, I think um, one of the issues with budget season is oftentimes um, we just, we don't get a lot of comments or something. And then it goes to we hours just us kind of going through and then um, it's kind of like a mad dash at the end, or at least that was the experience last year was a lot of comments after. And I think one of the things that would be great was to be maybe to um, just thinking uh, on the fly here because of what Mr. Rhodes said, I think it would be beneficial if we had those set dates maybe um, on the weekend. So that way we could just be able to have like maybe less of the days instead of, because this usually turns into six or seven days. <laughs> like this is usually the set and then it turns into six or seven more. So. Um, I would hate to lose a Saturday, but I'd also love to gain a whole week back. Other initial board comments before I go back around, um, Mr. Brand, and then I'll go back around for seconds. Um, one thing I know this past year, we did have town council members come to your presentation and others. So I would just say when we send out that agenda to just add them to it so that, mm -hmm. you know, everybody feels invited. Um, and then just because we're we're kind of already talking about it, um, my only hesitation with Saturday, and if you remember, I was like the, I got Paul's teacher voice when, when I was anti-Saturday, but um, I, I do appreciate the thought and my only uh, kind of amendment to the idea just to put in people's minds is maybe to have the presentations from 
the people that lead those departments. And then as everybody gets to digest everything, maybe that like middle one, that 13th instead is like, that's when you come on a Saturday with your questions. Now that you've had time to absorb everything, you know, everybody who's here and other department leaders can just come and present to us. And then if we have questions, and I think we did this when we had the Saturday one, we actually uh, let the superintendent and the board chair know like, this is our question about math. And then this way, if, you know, Wendy is the person that would answer that, Wendy knows, well, what a bummer. I have to be there on Saturday now to talk about it. But if there are, there's nothing preempt for Mr. Farisi, then Mr. Farisi gets to brag that he doesn't have to come on a Saturday. So just something like that, where we're just a little bit organized in the effort. And then then you have that next official meeting where maybe Mr. Farisi gets five or 10 questions. So just a thought to throw out there. Yeah, and I just wanted to just interject as well that um, while these are five dates list listed here, my past experience in the past few years, there are many more dates um, added because I, I feel as a body, we do truly pour over these agenda books, find every nickel, dime, and penny, and really, really put thoughtful consideration into this. So it ends up being much more than, than is listed here. Is there anyone else who wants to make an initial comment before I circle? I just want to... No, I know. I just um, part of the what I was going to do tonight is let everybody initially comment and then go back just so everyone gets a chance. Uh, Ms. Pratty. Yeah, just on the Saturdays, there's certain Saturdays that I would prefer not to be in a room with you guys. So I'm sorry, I let you know, <laughs> but I like my kids spending time with my kids. Um, and if we can, I do also appreciate the, you know, that suggestion because the evenings also missing dinner is is hard. Um, so um, I think, you know, a compromise like Mr. Brenda said is, you know, have these two and then maybe a Saturday for questions and it can be like the, you know, nine to noon type of thing um, or whatever it is. But yeah, I'm okay with certain Saturdays. So I would like I had a, you know, if we can have input on the specific Saturday, that would be preferable. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Question was because I was trying to ask Ms. Jones. Um, are you saying the Saturday after this Wednesday? Because that makes sense. Because it's that's why I'm just trying to understand. Because I've never. Can I respond? Oh, yeah. Please. Okay. Do. So I mean, I don't care. I just know that like these two, like that's a lot of the book yeah. on Tuesday and Wednesday. Yeah. That's like it's a lot, and I I think we're probably biting off more than we can chew to say that much of the book. Um, I know that in past experiences, by the time we get to the end, we're not given, it, it's just hard to like digest it all, right? So whether we break this out and maybe we start a little bit earlier, not earlier in the day, like earlier, like we say, okay, we're gonna do the seventh and eighth, ninth and 10th, like not the ninth and 10th, like the next week too. I just think this is too much for weeknights. So whether or not we maybe say we're going to do Tuesday and Wednesday and then that uh, sat the following Saturday or something like I just think this is too much and I don't um, know if we're going to be true to the budget if we try and put that many tabs in two nights. Okay, thank you. So I do agree with that. Um, it does look like a lot at once and it was part of the budget last year. Um, could we, is there a reason why we start in February? Can we not start in January? Is there like... Why are we starting only in February? It's still the the board now or the folks that are meeting internally, we are just now looking at the budget. So we haven't even reviewed the internal submissions. That'll be done before Christmas break. And then after break, Lou and I and the internal team need to kind of say, what are we going to keep in this budget? What are we going to slice out? So we're not prepared to present much before February. That's kind of in the timeline. Thank you. I'm going to go to Ms. Droz and then uh, Ms. Rada. So my second question was just a refresher and maybe somebody can answer because I don't remember. So we go through all the tabs and then we come back and we say, hey, can we cut here and there? Is that still when it's still your budget or does it have to? I felt like it had to be transmitted to the Board of Ed so where it says pop uh, uh, when it becomes ours as the board of ed and then we make budget request cuts yes i just i don't remember that timeline if you could refresh my memory i would be splendidly happy lou you can correct me if i'm wrong but i present my board budget and then i turn it to the board 
for their discussion and deliberation. Is that accurate? That's so, well, you come back, but like, so where in here was that day? Because that day was also another long day where we sat in line by line and said, hey, we want to make take a hundred thousand dollars out of this. Da, da, da. Is that the budget review day? It's the first date after my presentation. So, so that the 13th. Oh, no, that's there is the yes, it would be the 13th. Assuming we can get through all the programs on the 7th and the 8th, then on the 13th the board would start deliberating. And that would be a motion at, during that meeting. Okay. Go ahead. Well, I, I might have missed it. Is there a reason why we're not meeting midweek on that, the Feb 15 instead of the 13th? Okay, look at the school calendar. Is that Feb? Um, no, the break no. would be. Yeah, it's not a break. No, so there's no break. Oh, uh, could be that I'm at a conference. Okay, gotcha. Which is totally fine. Yeah, you know we can the work around I'm you available, sometimes. available, but that probably wouldn't be very popular. We've done it before, actually. I've I have PTSD from that. But um, <laughs> on a on a serious note, I I just I think we have to think about too the fact that you know maybe what we do because it sounds like. There's some thoughts about Saturday. There's some thoughts about maybe adding days. And I do want to be cognizant of the fact that Dr. Fletcher wasn't able to be at this meeting. So may, it might be worth our efforts tonight if we motion for the first, seventh, and eighth to just so that this the staff knows these are the dates that we're going to do all the things. And then maybe Dr. Fletcher could send out like a which Saturdays could you be free? Because what if, like to Amy's point, what if nobody is? And then we can set the other dates at a later time? I guess my question would be, can that be done via email? Is that, cause the, is that a date that has to be voted on? Yeah, so just so what I'm saying is, if we, we set the presentation and the department presentation dates so that everybody who is going to be expected to be here knows okay i got to block the seventh i got to block the eighth i got to block the first and then before our january meeting maybe dr fletcher just sends a note to everybody that says weekends and in, in february which ones would you be free and then when we come back to that january meeting we bang out like okay here's the to danielle's point here's where we are gonna start going line by line here's questions all the things this way we kind of have I don't know, some sort of set, set schedule. So on the agenda, it said, is it my turn? You kind of look sorry. Sure. I, yeah, I was, okay. I'm, I'm processing. Sorry, I'm just trying to process that and think. So it uh, says discussion and possible action. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if we actually have to make an action tonight. Um, and I don't want to rush. Like, so if I think a conversation with Dr. Fletcher is important. I'm still worried about all of those tabs in two days. So in that discussion, even if we said February 7th, February 8th, maybe February 13th would be another tab day. And then can we push, you're in a conference, so maybe the 22nd, can we do another board meeting be like on the 28th for the possible adoption? Like, can we like can we squeeze in another day? So whether it's a Saturday or it's another day of the week, I, I always feel like budget season, like squish, squish, squish. And then we're like scrambling around to be like, oh my gosh, can we do this date? Can we do this date? I'd rather plan ahead. I think we need at least one more day scheduled in there to go through those tabs. Just a quick question for Lou. Is March 1 the transmission date to the town? I believe March second is the requirement. March second, so it has to do that. Charter. So it's charter. Uh, yep. Uh, Miss Yap, then. Sweeper. I can ask a little bit. I thought the transition meant March first. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 I thought the transmission day was later than that last year. Did it change? No. It was always March. March second is by the charter, but yeah. that's to the town manager. The town manager has two weeks. Then two weeks to. Oh. Uh, do his evaluation and make a presentation of a bu our budget 
incorporated with the town's budget on March 15th. Okay, um, and to Danielle's point, um, I understand Dr. Fletcher is not here, and I know y'all like kids and families and things like that, and for babies and everything, but um, can we figure out these dates now and then like not later, like not via email and it gets all confusing because sometimes I might not see emails. I would rather, I think we have enough of the board here to figure out at least one extra day to break up that um, review area. And I think that that would be fair to like Wendy and Steve because we have the Tuesday, February 7th, February 8th, and then something in between. Can we figure that out today? Would like Saturday, February 11th be a date to consider? And we could vote on it. Well, not February 9th, we work. Ms. Weaver, and then we'll, let's. Yeah, I was going to say, I think just for time's sake, um, either we just kind of like let this go and we can, I mean, here's the deal. We can, it's a possible action, so there's no motion on the table. I think we would have to change the motion a lot uh, to do this. Um, I'm fine with doing that. Uh, I just want to make sure, I think to Mr. Brando's point, it was just get some dates on the calendar. And then if we need to revise on our January meeting, obviously we don't want that to be too short notice, but that's still at least three weeks notice. Um, I think that's fine. I just want to make sure this doesn't. I think that's a great point. So getting some dates out there and then vote on that tonight. So at least folks can plan ahead and then make necessary revisions or not at the January meeting. Correct. So I'm going to ask so we can kind of move this conversation along. If somebody would like to um, make a motion on or let me back up. My apologies. Do we want to add in, add to the motion? an adoption of an additional day that could be amended if need be at our January meeting, if that's possible. Okay, so with that being said, can someone help me calendar wise and tell me the Saturdays? February 11th. Okay, the Saturday. <laughs> so are we comfortable adding? Sorry, go ahead. It would be the 11th or the 18th is over break, so we don't want that one, and the 25th potentially. So 11 or 25, I think, are the two Saturdays. That, yep, that would work because the budget adoption meeting should be the 20th. I don't know. We, we should adopt on the. Well, we were trying to break up what today else, but we're trying to break up this review area. So that 11th would make sense because she's trying to break up the review area. Okay, uh, yes, and then go ahead. Oh, Amy, Amy and then Dick, I'm sorry. Um, is the 16th a possibility, a Thursday? So it's the, so we have Monday the 13th and then Thursday the 16th instead of doing a Saturday. It's a Saturday. I'll be out of town. Okay. The 16th is a Thursday, sorry. Oh yeah. It's listed as a Wednesday in the, um, Agenda. Uh, well, in real life, it's a um, Mr. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's good cast. So I like the idea of adding Saturday, and I know you want you know, but Saturday, February 11th, because if we should get through the tabs, then we wouldn't need it. But it's there if we feel like the tabs are going too late, and then if we get through all the tabs, we don't need the meeting. But rather than saying we're going to stay till 12 o'clock at night to push through the tabs, is not probably our best idea. Miss Yavna, Miss Weaver. Miss like, Weaver. Yeah, and I think um, the point too would be that we can have that Saturday. I think just to emphasize Mr. Brandon's point, have that Saturday to be like a review where we come with pre prompted questions. That way we don't waste our time or anybody else's time. It becomes an efficient manner of we come with our questions. So, you know, it's just already there. I'm not saying we can't ask other questions, but you can have the relevant so I, parties there. I feel that we should move ahead and yeah. make this motion and vote on it. Yep. Yeah. And because I think we've all expressed ourselves and we need to keep it moving. So looking for a motion with the addition of that date. Move the Board of Education officially established dates to review the superintendent's estimate, estimate superintendent's estimates for the 2023-2024 school budget to include February 1st, 2023, February 7th, 2023, February 8th, 2023, February 11th, 2023. February 13th, 2023, and February 22nd, 2023, as outlined in the memo from the Superintendent of Schools. Second. Thank you. We'll move for a roll call vote. Michael Branda. Yes. Danielle Drozd. Yes. Beth Mankey Hup Wagner. Yes. Richard Leverrier. Yes. Amy Ferrati. 
Yes. Sam Sharma. Yes. Jessica Weaver. Yes. Anastasia Yaff. Yes. Passed unanimously. Thank you. Moving on to number three, which is discussion possible action um, on the board's CIP plan. All right. In your packet this evening is the draft CIP plan that was vetted by the facilities slash finance committee on November 28th. Um, it, it was in your packet, so I'm not going to go into detail page by page. Those earlier pages give you the background table of contents, historic uses of capital, um, especially recently, page four of nine gets into very recent projects. Page five of nine does outline what we estimate to be in the CIP reserve fund. And just to remind the board by charter, we get 125,000 allocated from the town every year. There's investment income. The bulk of the money for that uh, board CIP comes from tuition receipts. Uh, and one thing that has come up in recent years is an increase in the tuition receipts. So this year we projected about 800,000. Next year we're projecting a million because of just different sources of revenue coming into that line. So that's kind of an overview of where that money comes from. On page six of nine is this year's capital plan and as you'll know what we set out to do in the fall does get modified as the year rolls along because needs change for example we um, planned on having about sixty thousand dollars in hvac upgrades it actually through some other transfers are looking to put one hundred and fifty thousand in there so we can do some hvac work potentially at the high school uh, one of our science wings has very volatile temperature swings um, so to get that accomplished, we moved some money around. Uh, we had money set aside for playground renovation. This year we did have two slides at Wal uh, Patterson that needed that repair. Our Chromebook uh, budget is in here and we've done spending there. And I'll get to that in a minute with the capital. And then uh, district-wide paving, we made moved some money around and hope to get the NHS North lot done either in April or over the early part of the summer. Uh, we also had a lesser expense on our maintenance vehicle with trade-ins. We use less money there. So what we try to do is move money around to get more things done. So this is this year, nothing, no additional allocations, just moving money around to respond to changes. So that was discussed at the committee with the, with the board. Um, here is what the board is looking like, looking at for the five-year projection. Um, and again, it is stress, as you heard on the previous page, it's a snapshot in time. This is what we look at right now as our anticipated expenses, but things can change. So for next year, we hope to continue to do HVAC improvements, some carpet replacements, painting, playgrounds. We will. I will explain to the board momentarily what is in the um, technology plan. The um, And then district-wide blacktop is typically every year we have a need there and district-wide vehicles. Now, again, the district-wide vehicles are not buses. These are maintenance vans, utility vehicles that run their course and need to be replaced periodically. And then we do project out five years as required by the capital budget. But as I present that to you today, this could change um, when we meet again next year at this time. These are just pr projections as we know it right now. Here is something that um, the board spent quite a bit of the board subcommittees spent quite a bit of time on last week. Um, in the capital plan, pay as you go, this is where we are making our request to the town. And um, we again get the $125,000 by charter. We still are finalizing some security enhancements at the high school. We have the secure vestibule, but right now, there are some needs to protect the um, people that sit there every day. Right now, they're still vulnerable when people come in that foyer. We're looking to enhance that. Uh, the big discussion for the board is the determination that the subcommittee's made about moving forward on the John Wallace wings. 
Um, we spent considerable time on that. We looked at a couple of different scenarios. As the board is aware, we did do a pilot up there, a model classroom. Uh, while it was a step in the right direction, many, uh, only about 50% of the folks at Wallace felt it was the way to go because there were concerns that the room was quite small when you sealed it off with a door, the lighting wasn't fantastic. Uh, circulation was going to be improved, but it was still not ideal. And people, the storage in that room would be uh, very minimal. So after quite a bit of deliberation, the subcommittees voted to move forward in a, as a pay-as-you-go project at Wallace. So you can see here, there are three years projected out at $3 million a year, with the fourth year being a million dollars. Um, and each of those years would be one wing per year, and it would be a full renovation, uh, but this is also reimbursable with state grant money. And currently our reimbursement rate is 58%. Um, I believe we have, I have a chart here tonight, but I also think I have something on the board. Um, the only other thing in this uh, account would be uh, the bus replacement cycle. And I'm gonna get into those details momentarily. Right now, the bus replacement cycle is what we agreed to last year for 88.725. We spent a lot of time on that last year, hearing the pros and cons of different uh, time for the replacement cycle. We landed on a, an 11-year replacement cycle. Here is the other possibility. Uh, the only other possibility for John Wallace is to ask the town to put it forward as a referendum. So that would be a possibility here. The board can vote on that this evening. And the only other thing we've put on as possible referendum project is the uh, turf field. Um, that would be at the high school. And again, that's several years out. So as some attachments here, this picture shows you what a potential um, rep renovation at Wallace would look like. This is probably a better depiction. And Lou, feel free to, if you wouldn't mind, while I hold this up for the board, if you just give a brief overview of what this is. Sure. It's on the board, it's on the screen too, but okay. this is probably better. The, uh, what Dr. Brown is holding up is the architectural rendering I received today, which has on the left, the current configuration of each of the three wings. This one page is just wing three by itself. Sure. There's also another one for page four or for wing four and wing six as you just leaf through the page for this. But the one comment at the last uh, committee meeting was what would it look like if we tried to achieve similar square footage uh, for each classroom? And that would be on the right hand side. If you go back and look at the computer screen, Dr. Brown can move it aside. You can see the picture on the lower half is actually turned sideways, but you'll see there's that one small room in there, which is really just a breakout space, a conference area. So the choices become uh, in the wings, do you try to achieve larger, more spacious classrooms with a you know small supplemental breakout spaces if needed, or do you try to have true uh, the best balance possible of every room being as large as possible without trying to have the smaller breakout spaces. So that's one illustration. And you'll see we'll have that uh, uh, through the other sketches that Dr. Brahma has here. Uh, you can't see it from here, but uh, there is a square footage uh, number on each classroom. You can just even read off any one of them on the right hand side. Uh, on the right hand side, it ranges from 625 square feet all the way up to 705. Um, and currently they're all about 625 maximum. So that one is the tightest wing for space uh, because there's no, you know, the whole, it's a shorter wing than the others. Uh, there is really minimal space for moving around. We're on the one that's on the screen, I believe is somewhere around 740 square feet per big room. And the breakout space is about 280, if I remember correctly. So that's just the, you know, that's a decision down the road based right. on, you know, the enrollment of the school, what kind of programming spaces uh, that are necessary. Uh, over the years, and this is my 30th year here, uh, there's never been more than uh, nine sections in any one uh, grade level in the entire time. Uh, there's never been a year that I can recall where there was more than one grade level that had nine. And at the most, it, 
we had 32 uh, or 24 total classes between grades six, seven, and eight. So the options that are presented provide at least a minimum of eight classrooms, full-size classrooms per wing, plus modest breakout spaces, where we try to make everything as big as possible where it could be a classroom, but one or two of them would be on the tight side, but nothing would be anything smaller for a classroom than what's there right now. So it would be only improvements upward uh, for space with all of the security attributes that we'd be looking for. Okay. So that would be a $3 million per year. Obviously the particulars are not being decided tonight, no. just the opportunity to put forward a $3 million per year suggestion to the town. Okay, I'm gonna open up for uh, questions. Ms. Yap and then Ms. Weaver. Um, thank you. Um, I just wanted to clarify, we, we're only um, discussing moving one of the options forward, which is the $3 million per year, not the $10, uh, $10 million to a referendum. It was yes. just one option. Lou felt we should still display what a referendum would look like, but the board can determine this evening that they don't even want to put that on there. But that would be an option. The board already ruled out the option of simply putting doors on the classrooms. They felt that that was not going to solve the problem adequately. Well, in the subcommittee meeting, we decided out of the three options to only move one floor mm -hmm. to the board, correct? Yes. Okay, just want to make sure. Yes, um, that is what you decided. The second question is Can we do? the classroom, sorry, just one question. The classroom that we physically went in and saw, how many square feet is that, the one that you've already renovated? 625 maximum. The one that we physically went that in and saw? That was finished. Yeah, that we finished small... the wall, right? <coughs> okay. That's the most it could be. No, it, it's probably a little smaller than it. It's probably about 610, but I have to go back and specifically measure it to be <coughs> sure. Okay, thank you. Ms. Weaver. Yeah, my question is, um, I, gu I guess I just want to go over the pros and cons weighing the referendum versus the pay as you go um, in terms of reimbursement rate and why we didn't go with a referendum. I mean, I'm just looking at the size of Wallace and obviously it, it needs a lot of work. And we obviously went with a referendum for Anna Reynolds just in terms of compare and contrast those two schools. Um, the pay as you go option would be faster. Okay. Uh, a referendum could not be on the ballot until the fall yeah. at the earliest. Yep. We'd have to go through all of that preparation. And each year we could apply for a reimbursement grant. So the, the net cost would be the exact same. Okay. It would just be much quicker to do it this way again, if the town agrees. So um, that is why the subcommittee is recommending uh, this this option. And just to clarify with their statement that those three, it would just be those three years. I'm sorry, I didn't follow like the question. The three, that's three segments. It's four years, sorry. Of, four years of with the last year being finishes. Um, and these are still estimates because you don't get okay. a final cost until the, they do a deep architectural analysis. Mm -hmm. But it would be three years, each wing per year. Then that last year would be just finishing off different things. Okay. Thank you. Mr. LaBarriere and then Ms. Pratty. Uh, yeah, just um, brief. Uh, to, number one. Oh, thank you. I know I keep forgetting. Um, can you tell me a little more about the the breakout area, um, like what its purpose is? Go ahead, okay. uh, Typically, that's used for small group instruction, tutorial spaces, or if specialists need to come in and use uh, pull out arrangements with students. Okay, and um, I, I don't know if this is something that maybe can even be addressed or if it's uh you know if it would have any impact on the on the drawing but for the purposes of security uh would it be under the new configuration i'm just looking at wing four for example would it be possible to make the door to the uh boys and girls toilets to come from inside the wing as opposed to having to go from what appears to be outside of the wing uh that would require a complete renovation of the bathrooms because everything would be out of place uh, to code for uh, plumbing fixtures and all of the uh, egress and access requirements that go with it. The, it would not be a problem to do it on the side. It's just the price tag that goes with it. Okay. I mean, and it it, it would all theoretically allow the teachers to keep a closer eye on the kids too. But um, yeah. Anyway, just a thought. I guess. Yeah. Thanks, Miss Pratty. Thanks. Um. So I have two questions. I will ask one if um that's what we're doing. Um, so my first one is, 
with either of the the options the breakout room or the classroom um are we losing like three or four classrooms in this proposed renovation the answer is no uh right now you have 29 classrooms uh in between all three wings and all of those uh with the exception i believe of two are a maximum of 625 square feet open concept classrooms that are there at a minimum we would put if the preference was to go with smaller breakout spaces you would have either 24 or 25 much more generous classrooms probably averaging 750 square feet or more across all three wings with five additional uh, breakout rooms which are more conference room size um, for general use or we would be able to have 29 rooms that are 24 of them would be 700 feet or more and there would only be i believe two that would be under 700 square feet so uh it would just be a matter of what's the preference and where's where do we get the most flexibility for either plugging it with a regular uh classroom full of students this year or are there was breakout spaces for a small group instruction more more precious because even on the wing i believe it's wing six which has the nine rooms uh there's one breakout space for around 600 square feet that could be subdivided in two even with interior partitions and picking up there's two working spaces for the area so the uh, uh, making sure we have flexibility of design and the ability to be nimble with resource allocations depending on what's going on for uh, student needs would be uh, you know well served by a uh, really either of these plans and we're putting back 10 to 15 percent square footage everywhere okay, by so being able to do this the classrooms there's 10 and two wings and nine and the other right. the rooms not all of them are used currently as actual like full 24 or whatever Correct. class students mm -hmm. right so yes only 20 however many big classes there's enough space i guess it was my year, i've been here when it was tight too so when okay. you had a i just want to make sure because it so. just looking at the drawings it looks like you're losing two pretty large rooms for smaller breakout potentially um so okay that was my first. i'll I just want to inquire regarding that um what 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 is the preference or the need what have the teachers and administrators said i mean i know our opinions are very valuable i just want to make sure that we under we have a really firm grasp on what they say they truly mm -hmm. like those breakout rooms is that something that they see as a need um a comment on that i think just to remind the board tonight we're not choosing a final drawing we're not choosing a final design we're simply saying we agree or not to go forward with a pay as you go over that four year span. Then if it's approved, of course, then it has to go to the town. Then we would get a committee together, board member participation, teacher participation to get the, the ed, ed specifications that, that would tell us what do people really want out of this. Um, so that just as a reminder that the granular details are, are not to be, you know, are not going to be decided upon tonight. Thank you for that clarification. I will go around um, for second comments. If anybody has additional comments they'd like to make. Uh, go ahead, Ms. Pratty. Thank you. Um, so with the two options, and I know the recommendation is to do the pay as you go, um, is there a possibility, like if the um, town does not agree that that's a good option, is the possibility that we can then fall back on potentially exploring a renovation referendum for the renovation or are we like this is our one chance and then we just ask again next year if we whatever our capital budget goes to the town they're going to either say yay or nay I, I suppose they could modify it last year they did that with the roof but um, I don't know that we would be able to switch up and do the referendum midstream. So I think it would either be yes to this or no to this, or maybe they'll cut the budget. I don't know. I think any any number of events can happen. Ms. Yap. So um, I just want to make sure I'm clear. 
We're not exploring two options tonight, um, as we had one option that went to the board. Um, the subcommittee was the Finance and Facilities Committee. I and Lou is a voting member, but one voting member can't make a decision to just move something to a board. Um, the Finance Committee consists of Anastasia Appa's chairman, Danielle Drodes, thank you, Secretary, um, and uh, Sam Sharma. And the Facilities Committee consists of Dr. Fletcher, um, Danielle Drodes, again, Secretary, and uh, Sam Sharma. And together, all six of us voted that one option, oh, including Luke, because he's a voting member um, to the board. So although I do respect and appreciate uh, the fact that you want to um, advocate for the $10 million referendum, uh, the subcommittee, well, and there was, we had three options and we all decided unanimously that only one option was going to the board, not two. So I want to make sure that that's clear. Thank you. Ms. Weaver. Yeah, I just want to clarify. We're just discussing, like, we'll discuss the policy stuff too. We're just discussing, like, it's not a recommended. She's just saying that's a that's a fallback if that was that was an option presented in your meeting. Like, this is from your meeting. From the meeting was one option only. Right, but but we as a board just we're just discussing like pros and cons too because it's coming to the full board. So as the capital budget if we put this into a motion it would be the pay as you go that we vote on so that's what we're voting on yeah right, it's just we're I'm discussing saying. what was discussed in your committee meeting right if that makes sense same yeah. as we discuss the policies that are discussed in our policy discussion like our subcommittee we're just discussing what was discussed there and then we'll ultimately decide if we would like to pass or move the motion tonight and then if we would like to vote on the that option that is actually in the capital budget as presented on the screen that's the capital budget uh, Ms. Drodzen, I think we should move this conversation forward. Okay, I just want, I want to just um, clarify. So the, I, I'm not going to speak for Ms. Yap, but I think it's a frustration. We had a very rich conversation that we weren't even going to discuss the referendum because we just, it, like, okay. we really, so I think that's where the frustration, so, okay. like, with the policy meeting, like, if someone all of a sudden said, let's talk about this policy, we're like, but that wasn't even on the table, I think. So, it's, I, I, so just I think that's, I understood. That okay, that, that that's helpful. I mean, I was just literally asking if we wanted the, <laughs> like, well, I think it's also just helpful that visual we use every year, too, to be like, these are considerations that we always do. We don't actually vote on it, but it's like things that, we've considered as bonding projects. So to me, I just was wondering, pros, cons, I'm good with the pay as go. Thank you for the explanation. I will support this motion. So at this time, um, to move our conversation forward and to move this item forward, I would call if if the board so chooses for a motion to be made and seconded. We did have a few more oh, details. So That's sorry. okay. My oh. apologies. Mm -hmm. We just need to talk about the bus replacement cycle and the tech replacement cycle yeah. very briefly yeah uh, the, we had already agreed last year and it was adopted by the town so i believe that this is still in the capital budget for the town the only thing i wanted the board to comment on is bus prices have gone up by 15 percent uh, as a result of the inflation we're all dealing with so we just needed the board to determine whether we leave it as an, the initial amount and we just have to adjust how many buses we buy or do we account for inflation and ask for 562034 so that is a decision that needs to be made tonight um so right now i would say we would leave it as the the agreed upon amount unless the board wants to amend it to the inflation amount which is again 562034, and it is on the board tonight, and it is in your packet. Um, and I also felt like um, the board may just want to see what's in the technology plan, just to make sure they know what they're voting on, because we did not get into that detail at the um, initial meeting because it was not ready. But here on the screen is our current technology budget. It reflects, and just remind the board that every year, we replace K, 5, and 9 because the ki the kindergartners currently are going to roll with their laptops up to the next grade and so on and so forth. So every year we replenish grades uh, K, 5, and 9. We will continue next year to use the practice of using our Chromebook insurance money to pay for cases. That was something that the board had uh, put forth last year, and we're going to do it again this year. Um, and then we need iPads some high school art um, computers, 
a staff laptop replacement. Doc cameras are very popular. Teachers use those in instructional tools. We need to replace those. Um, displays. Um, could you remind me, Craig, what is Newtonix? Nerds, compute and storage platform for all the servers access the recovery site. Okay, yeah, thank you. Amongst the district uh, operations and uh, instructors. Very good. And then exterior Wi-Fi, we're making a concerted effort that teachers, when they evacuate for a drill or a real emergency, can have Wi-Fi access while outside. That is part of our safety protocol. So that total um, package is 679, but our replacement cycle, I believe, was six. Fingerprinting, that is our uh, computer. Craig, you want to add to that discussion? The single firewall appliance we need to connect securely to the state police. Uh, that device is end of life. So, so that will replace an end of life device, end of support device that currently is required for fingerprinting employees and doing background checks. Okay, and then I, I could touch upon next year, but again, it's a cycle. So we look at which computer labs and those are kind of becoming obsolete. Uh, but there are still a few that have specialized uh, purposes like art and STEM. Um, we will do a similar cycle with the Chromebooks. Next year, we'll try to use Chromebook insurance if we can. That's going to be the game plan going forward. Um, and then a STEM lab, high school art lab, um, and Unitrends. I need Craig to explain that. Yeah, I try not to use product names for these when I can, but internally, that's the, that's the current product for our backup solution. That's a combination of hardware and cloud storage. So when our systems are backed up, they're also replicated to the cloud for fault tolerance and business continuance. So finance, HR, things like that. All right. Go ahead. I'm just super confused about your 2022-2023 budget revised. So for K6, Four hundred and seventy-nine dollars, three hundred and fifty, and it says zero dollars. And the next one over, the revised. Oh, pardon blue. me. And then fingerprinting, it says eleven hundred one, and then one point one million. So. One thousand. Yeah. yeah. No. Eleven hundred dollars. Cost. Right. Unit price and quantity cost extended over the total. Eleven hundred dollars times one is eleven hundred dollars. But the counter says. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's, a dot. it's a dot. Oh, okay. Thanks. Thank you. Getting off. And then that first one, why is that zero? We actually had some ESSER grant monies came in separately for computers that we wrote and that offset the cost. Thank you. All right. I don't know. Craig, I don't know. We are getting two different. Okay. So you're not losing your mind. That actually is happening. It's not been that long of meeting yet. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, yes, Ms. Prouty. Um, I just have a question back on the buses for a minute. Um, I know that there was some legislation to have electric buses in 10 ish years. I'm just, and I know they're more expensive. So is that something that we also would need to consider? So not only the inflation of these existing buses, or are we thinking about replacing existing buses with elect electric buses and therefore would be more expensive and maybe we should consider increasing that? We are, we actively applied for a green bus grant. We were not awarded it though they, basically awarded mostly to tribal uh, applicants. So we are still in the running for that. So we are looking for every opportunity to write grants for an electric bus so we can do a pilot to see how they go. They are significantly more expensive, but with grant money that does help you with, um, you know, offsetting the cost. There are some infrastructure things that we need to do. If we were to switch over to electric buses, their charging stations are fairly large. Um, so there are some changes that we would need to make. So our first line of uh, work would be to get a grant and get a trial bus. And um, so with that, we would get the bus relatively, probably half the price. Ms. Yap. What's the cost of an electric bus and can it be stored outside like regular buses or do they have to be under some sort of garage? Or I will let Lou field that question. 
Uh, it's 350,000 or more for the bus itself. The charging station infrastructure will be dependent on how many vehicles you have. So if you have 10 uh, school buses, you'll need 10 high-speed charging stations to support that. Uh, it's probably $75,000 yeah. for the base. 60,000 is what Dean said to me in a recent meeting. 10, 15,000 dollars for every um, so it, it's very cost here. prohibitive, unfortunately. Maybe on the, they can get outside, but I, I didn't hear him say otherwise yeah. in terms of that. The big issue is they have to be plugged in and recharging wherever they land at night. And that's where the charging stations have to be developed and, you know, planned for. So 425,000 per bus is each bus to be on a charging station? A charging station, I believe, can handle two to four buses, Lou. Is that correct? Usually two. Two. And since it'll be high speed high capacity needs you're going to need like the most uh the top end of the uh delivery system for it which i think we're uh you know sixty thousand to just build out the infrastructure to get the power out to the general area and then you have as many towers as you build to support the size of your fleet which means they couldn't be stored just, to, I'm just, I'm just so can they can they can I, they not be stored next to the buses we already have the answer is yes to oh, okay that's right. what yeah to. they look exactly the same except their guts are different right. okay thank you okay so to move us along i would like to ask if somebody could make a motion if there is not more pressing conversation if we can move to that I, it was just about the uh technology it's just are we including the inflation numbers or not that was just that is that, was, that would be a final discussion is that a separate motion? i'm just uh, yeah i'm just curious how that affects the capital how we accepted it well, I think we'd ha we'd have to decide if have the discussion about it because this motion is right. not including it. So, so that would be an amended motion then. Or you'd amend if what's we in the packet. To include it, yeah. We'd have to do an amended motion. No motion is in there. Exactly. Yeah. So anybody can make a motion. I, I just wanted to ask about that because I was just curious. I mean, obviously, like we just got 50 base points today in the rate hike. So I mean, I don't know. Stagflation seems to be stagnating and i anticipate a recession or will claim to be a recession in the next few months so i'm just curious um and one of the things we discussed last time was either in decreasing the budget by a hundred thousand for our special ed transportation um so i'm just curious if we include the anticipated inflation adjustments tom can come back say no come back with the other one like i'm just curious how that process again works where i, I forget if they will they can come back and just say no flat or no and a recommendation with the approved numbers that they recommend just curious to that process they they can come back with any numbers they they can just reduce it yeah uh, mr rose and miss yao i don't think that we should i would my gut feeling would be that we're better off saying it's tough times, inflations are high. We only buy 10 buses instead of 11 because we're asking for $3 million in the capital improvement. And at some point in time, we need to, you know, tighten our belts because we have, you know, we we have to account for our spending too. So I know we're on an 11 year cycle, but if this year we only buy 10, then we only buy 10. Maybe we get a freebie from a, you know, a grant. So that would be my suggestion. But yeah. Um, I also agree with Ms. Rhodes on that one because I know there are some other things that we may need that um, may supersede an additional bus. And maybe if we just stick with the 400, is it 88,000? 488, 725. If we stick with the 488, thank you, 725, um, we might be able to advocate for other things that we need in our budget, as well as the Wallace Project, which at least our committee was in agreement needs to be redone. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Just last thing. Um, I just wanted to clarify too. This, as is, it doesn't necessarily impact. I, I guess my question is, it doesn't impact the maintenance of the buses or anything. This would just replace. This is just the replacement cycle. This is strictly buying a bus. Maintenance is in the board's budget in a separate section. And did Dean Barnes have anything to say about <laughs> any of the, like, was this proposed by Dean or by by Lou's adjustments? I guess. Dean has been doing research on the current okay. price of buses, yeah. so he did yeah. indicate that the current uh, industry rate is a 15% rate hike. Obviously, yeah. things are volatile right now, yeah, and it could no, go yeah. in a different direction. <laughs> we'll ask Powell. Um, and just follow up on, on that line of thought. If we don't put in the inflation budget, we can't follow this plan. I guess just like I always like to do the opportunity cost when we don't put that in the budget. What does that mean? We buy fewer buses. Okay. 
and you roll the dice. It, we could get lucky and the buses are going to get another year out of them or yep. we trade in and we get some okay. offsets. So we would make it work. Um, I, I do believe the replacement cycle is the way to go. So I want us to keep in yep. that pathway. I think it's going to be better for us in the long run. So um, the board will decide, but I think I'm hearing people are leaning toward the original number, at least for now. Thanks. Ms. Pratty. I will read the motion. However, I just have a quick question on the 2023, 20 potential CIP bonding projects. We just want to remove the $10 million for John Wallace. So that so is what I heard tonight. It yes. has to be amended to remove that yes. item. Okay, so I will okay, we're ready. try to do that. Very Move good. the Board of Education approve the capital improvement projects for fiscal years 2023 to 24 through 2027 through 28 to be funded through public school capital improvement project reserve fund and remove the $10 million. Oh, on the bonding page for John Wallace renovation. Second. Okay. Oh. We'll now move to our roll call vote. Michael Brando. Sorry, discussion first. I'm sorry. Sorry. All right. Is there any discussion? Okay. We will now move to a roll call vote. Michael Brando. Yes. Danielle Dro. Yes. 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 We are budget transfer. We are. We are on F4. <laughs> <clears throat> yep. We're moving on to our uh, item uh, F4 under new business is the action item budget transfer. This is a very typical process where we have ebbs and flows in the budget where Lou has to make some midstream corrections. Those are noted on the third, second page of your packet for this item and it there is no net change to our bottom line we're simply moving things around to balance the budget if anyone has any specific questions i would uh ask lou to field those but this is essentially just balancing the budget by moving things around some things are more expensive some things are less expensive and you have to constantly adjust to make things work so I'll turn it back to the chair for any questions. Are there any questions by <coughs> board members at this time? Yes, Ms. Yeah. Um, it looks like we're taking $26,059 from math. Is that, um, what is that being cut? That's not uh, actually being a cut. Just, uh, just There were additional grant dollars that became available that allowed the budget to go down and charge it off to the grant. So are all these additional grant dollars no, there are uh, transfers between accounts because of circumstances, uh, employees switching, the resignation, the turnover that happens. As Mr. Friese spoke earlier, we had over 100 personnel changes between the end of the school year and the start of this year. So all those have to be reflected and the money adjusted to go into the right spots. So there was no programmatic okay. impacts that were here. On any of no. these? Thank you. Mr. LeVarriere. Um, as I remember last year, this was a bit of a controversy um, early on when we first uh, came in because um, there was concerns about uh, funds being too free, too easily moved from one area to another. In other words, that it may result in some sort of uh, fiscal padding to certain areas in order to maybe provide a cushion for another area. Um, and as I recall, this when this came up to a vote last time, um, it was it was not a unanimous yes. Okay, um, it, in the last year thinking about it, I believe that it is of course 
necessary that the superintendent and her and her team have the ability to move some money around. However, I I think that I think there should be a cap somewhere on that number. I mean, in in other words, having you know having an adjustment of forty five thousand dollars, seventy three thousand dollars. I mean, that's something that maybe we should have some sort of review over to determine whether that is actually necessary. Um, I'm not saying what that dollar is. I'm just saying I think that there should be a cap of some sort. Maybe that's something that we could talk about now, but just being able to say we can move money from this pile to this pile, as long as the dollars equal zero at the end, it creates um, it, it creates the potential for too much padding. We could ask Lou to go item by item so people could understand what each transfer was because why it was versus a, a padding issue. If there's grant money involved, positions came in cheaper, but Lou can give you each of these items. He can tell you why that was done or recommended to be done. I can address that right now if desired. Okay, so going down the list, first program art, uh, increase of 9,697. Uh, that was a result of a uh, existing staff member going on leave of absence for child rearing purposes. The long-term sub coming in to replace that person for the year uh, cost us another $10,000 approximately to do that. Uh, the next program, Career Tech, uh, we had a resignation uh, of a newer staff person who had just two years experience with us. And uh, when that position was vacated, a, a top scale teacher from one of the middle schools <coughs> came in and was certified in that position and took it at the high school. So it was a reduction in general classroom uh, cost by about $60,000 differential between the two salaries and needing to add that money into the career tech program. Uh, the third uh, item in educational technology showing a $36,000 uh, reduction. Uh, we had a resignation after the school year started of a $100,000 plus staff member and we were able to uh, hire or have an internal transfer was properly certified. And then because of the second vacancy that occurred, we were able to hire at the start of the, uh, the bottom of the salary schedule, which saved us $35,000 for it. Uh, the fourth one, uh, language arts, uh, with the shifting in uh, uh, class requirements and how many sections have to be offered, there was always a little bit of transition between the five big programs as far as one might be up 0.4 another one will be down 0.2 uh, where everything kind of works out for um, basically being the same by the end of the year and for this year uh, we have an additional 0.55 FTE assigned to the language arts area and with that came the additional cost of $62,000 all that is just reallocation from other staff members that are within this for in other programs. Uh, the world language programs up $11,945. That is a late uh, individual who just recently put in for retirement increment. So their salary uh, is going up $12,000 because of the incentive. The uh, next person, um, or next program is math uh, down $26,000. Uh, a new math coach was added. And we also had additional grant funds to compensate for hiring that position, plus being able to use that to pay other expenses of the program. So we were able to reduce the budget there, $26,000. <laughs> Music department, 11575 is the addition of an, another staff member who jumped on the retirement increment program for that amount. Uh, wellness, uh, new hire breakage, we had uh, one of the individuals uh, who took the uh, early retirement program last spring for the teaching staff was a member of the wellness staff. So uh, vacated a salary that was over $100,000 being able to be replaced at the start of the salary schedule. Uh, reading, uh, we had threw up $35,622. If I remember correctly, there are three new retirement increments from staff members who put in for it in that program. Uh, science has... Uh, a reduction of 70,112. That was strictly attributable to additional grant support through the ESSER program. Uh, STEM is up 10,166. Uh, that was the new 0.2 uh, staff person that was added. Uh, that individual also works for us in other non 
uh, non uh, bargaining unit uh, capacities and, and educational support. So it was very uh, fortunate of us to be able to find somebody who had the certification to fill that specific niche for us at that low of a rate. Uh, social studies down 37,749, uh, 0.15 reduction there. That was the uh, part of the staffing cost to support what went over to the language arts. <coughs> Uh, other salaries went down $73,000. Uh, that was uh, primarily due to uh, degree changes. All those dollars are budgeted in the uh, other salaries program. And when the confirmation that the individuals made their commitment to move up and advance in the salary scale, those dollars are then transferred out to the various programs they are assigned to. <coughs> Uh, special ed, we had an addition of 1.0 FTE on an LTS basis, which was uh, primarily con the big contributor to a $21,000 increase in that area. Uh, in the next two programs with the variant school counseling and school nurses, uh, we had uh, new hire breakage where uh, people coming in were paid less than the people who departed for resignation or retirement. Uh, Psychological services, I had $900 as a variance. I didn't identify a variance for that. So I'll have to skip that for the moment. Uh, the curriculum development area uh, showing 9690 uh, as additional money needed. That again is a re resignation, which has a new higher price tag that's uh, higher. Uh, Media library, a new person who jumped on the retirement increment program uh, for this year for 11325 uh, in the central direction area, we added a part-time, less than 20-hour non-union uh, clerk for the business office, and that was the cost for the year. Uh, we had uh, 54,000 additional dollars in the building direction account. This is for an additional part-time security uh, staff member, as well as um, changes we made to the hourly uh, pay schedules that were done in August. Uh, further down, in maintenance and plant, we had staff reassignment of 0.15 FTE each, which reduced those programs. And then in transportation, uh, 29.99, which is attributable to non-union bus driver uh, wage adjustments. So that's other than $900 that covers all the key items that were part of the um, uh, salary adjustments that went through. I my eyes. Um, Ms. Drez. I have a question from Mr. Giacomo. It's, it might be Mr. Farisi. And again, every year this one confuses me. I thought other, other salaries was to cover like um, the long-term sub and things like that. Like I thought that that's where that came from. So if you had salary adjustments because someone went up a step or um, you know, got a degree or whatever. I thought that came out of other salaries. That is correct. There are multiple items in the other salary account. All aspects of daily subs, long-term subs, and other uh, special coverage uh, needs all go through long through the other salaries account. In addition, you have uh, the degree changes. You have uh, uh, the money needed for individuals participating in the. Uh, it's the program with the state. We have the uh, mentors, or we can't think of the, the team program uh, that's there. Uh, we have money for uh, payment in lieu for those individuals of, uh, who don't take the medical insurance and receive the uh, uh, financial subsidy as part of it. Uh, we have, uh, what else is in there? Yeah, so the subsidy teachers and all those related things are probably $800,000 of that amount. So I guess along with what, and I know that's not my turn again, but along that same question, um, with what Mr. Lavi, I never say your name right. How do you say your last name? Laverrier. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Laverrier said, like I, I like I see that seventy three thousand, and so what is that point? So I appreciate I wrote down everything you said. It was very informative, but like breaking out like seventy three thousand dollars that we no longer need in that account is a lot. But I know it's not there. I know it's because it was already kind of earmarked so having that maybe not in the future like me writing down like a maniac but like spelled out would be more helpful yes uh, spelled out which way 
like this. The description of the, the page. description yeah. of yeah. what you just said. It's hard, hard for me to hear around yeah. four or five people here. So. Yeah. I'm a speaker than Ms. Yap. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think uh, Luke clearly knows uh, his stuff. Um, but I think, and you elaborated it even more, but like that line item page of just what it is that way. I Because I think this is a very normal process. Um, and to be honest, I mean, I disagree. I think that, you know, there there is good oversight and clearly we know where it's going. I think um, just if people have questions, then we can have it spelled out there and then Luke can provide even more color. Um, to any of the questions we have, um, because these to me are pretty normal, uh, not just for our district, but everybody's district. So, Miss Yap. Um, I have a couple questions. Um, and now I have extra. The library media specialist, you said there was a retiree, correct? Is that why you have this 11,000 media library? 11,320? Uh, correct. By the terms of the teacher contract, uh, any staff member who has enough years of service, uh, if they provide us three years of advance notice, uh, receives a financial incentive that's calculated based on years of service times their salary. So are they retiring this year? I don't remember. It's probably their first year on the it, program. The year yeah, first okay, year. so are we going to be preparing so we don't run into the same issues last year at the library and media specialist um, on this? And should we be... What? What? Yeah, that's what he said, library media, I wrote it down. So it says that they're going to retire, so they're retiring. I'm just asking as to when, so we can ensure that we have another library media specialist oh, yeah, in their place. Steve's office manages And we don't have the same issue we had uh, last year. Issues, staffing and, uh, uh, adjustments. Okay, I just want to make sure that we don't run into the same problem we did last year with not having enough for a library media specialist, because now we know that one will be retiring, correct? As of right now, let's take okay. case in mind. My second question, I'm sorry, Mr. Uh, is <clears throat> during our facilities meeting, we spoke about, and you guys weren't privy to this, so I'll just say it. Um, we had um, one, I think it was a tutor in every school that went from full time to part time. Correct me if I'm wrong. It, what is it, a coach, a tutor? Uh, Danielle, correct me. It was they were full time before, and now they're part time. Well, those are reading interventionists. Yes. So, is there any way that we could have allocated any money towards the reading interventionist? There was one from every single school that is now went from full time to part time. And we still need a reading interventionist. Is there any way we could have allocated any money to keep them full time as opposed to however else? They're full time this year. That was projecting for next year. So that's because some of the ESSER grant money's sunsetting. So we're having to plan for offloading people from that grant and then that's one of the ways we're going to have to do it unless the board has another opportunity so there's, there's no way we could keep them. but this is this year's budget you're, you're comparing um this year's to next year's <clears throat> thank you that's correct Ms. Drugs. Yep. Oh. Let's go. Are there any further? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see your hand. I mean, I, I'm i just thinking about looking at this recommended motion that maybe if we could add the caveat of putting in a capped amount. Ar I, arbitrarily, I'm just pulling out a number, call it $30,000. Make it that, that we approve the ability to move m money and then cap it at $30,000 and if it needs to go over that amount, send it to the facilities, or excuse me, the uh, finance subcommittee, and if they approve it, fine. Like something to that effect. I mean, I'm just, I'm just thinking that having, I, I, I don't know. I just seeing these amounts being able to be moved around without even really having that much of an update besides what we just heard right here, right now. I mean. It, it does alarm me a little bit. I do validate your comment, but I don't think that that would be a part of this motion, if, unless I have it wrong. I think this motion is just pertaining to these numbers we see right here. I'm, I'm thinking that might, and again, please correct me if I'm wrong, that that might be something to bring to the finance committee and that they could, if I'm saying this correctly, then they would look at making that, um, they would investigate that research, bring that to us as a potential discussion item and motion. I don't think so validating your comment, but I don't think it's a part of this motion. Right. Yeah. And I do appreciate that. What I was saying is that maybe we could just make it part of the motion. But I mean, um, I mean, I suppose that 
you know, the, whoever makes the motion is going to make the motion. But I'm just saying, I think that maybe putting a cap in it in that, say, thirty thousand dollars. Yeah. I would recommend that the finance subcommittee take that up because there are issues with policy or practices that would need to be considered. So, uh, but the finance subcommittee could take this up as a discussion item in a subsequent is, uh, agenda. Is it so? Is it possible that all right? So I, I guess can I? I'll make a motion. Can we table this? No. There's nothing at table. No. No motion was given. Oh, okay. Well, then never mind. Uh, all right, never mind. I'll make the motion just to <laughs> move us along here. Uh, move the Board of Education approve the reallocation of funds from one program line item to another as proposed by the Superintendent of Schools. Second. Discussion. Uh, all right, I'll, uh, can I make, I'll make a motion to table this motion? Is that right, procedurally? I don't even know. I'm thinking. I understand. Yeah, you have to second the motion. His motion. Okay, second. Discuss the table. So we're just okay. Discussion of the tabling. I thought on the tabling is this is um, operational stuff, <laughs> Lou very gave us a very detailed I feel like explanation of every item I don't think the idea of getting more information on this stuff in the future is a bad idea um, but I think that these are budget transfers that need to happen for these program areas and tabling the discussion which would be until the next calendar year at minimum I think is not in our best interest so I would say that we should not table it, we should move this forward. And then if the finance committee wants to come back in the calendar year of 2023 with a new idea on how to do this, I'll hear it out. But in this moment, I think this is an operational thing that has to move forward. Ms. Yeah. Um, I do think this should move to the finance committee and we can discuss it because I'm pretty sure um, there are more details to it than I know right now. So um, I am in agreement in regards to uh, moving this to the finance committee. Thank you. Um, I believe we covered everything and I think putting caps on would be I mean I think we really need to talk again about the role of the board and what our oversight is and what's micromanagement over what our board oversight is and if there's going to be seventy thousand dollars you just explain what those were so I mean I think more information is always needed but again we need to remember what our role of the board is and that's not to micromanage so if we are done with our discussion unless there's more additional pressing comments I think we are voting on the tabling of the most of the original motion can we also for just a how richard did. Yeah. no 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 you would just table it no and then, that would be a different motion you tabled, you guys just do your thing that's just, up to the front oh okay. Okay. yeah no okay. you're voting on tabling alone so we're table. voting right now we're taking a vote on tabling the initial motion that was put on the table. All right. Michael Miranda. No. Dan Meldrose. No. Beth Mankey Hepagner. No. Richard LaVarriere. Yes. Amy Parati. No. Sam Sharma. No. Jessica Weaver. No. Anastasia Yap. No. The motion failed seven to one. So we will now be voting on the original motion, motion that was seconded. Correct. That's. Yeah. Would you like me to read it, Lynn? Did you get that done? My motion? Yeah, I wrote yours down. Okay. Um, Michael Brandon. Yes. Danielle Drone. Yes. Ed Mikey Cutwagner. Yes. Richard LaBarriere. Yes. Amy Parati. Yes. Sam Sharma. Yes. Jessica Weaver. Yes. Anastasia. Yes. The motion passed unanimously. Okay. All right. We are moving. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. 
Um, we are going to move on to F5, which is discussion on board policies. And I just want to um, make it really clear that this is first informational from the policy committee and from Mr. Farisi, then a discussion based, but they are not votes um, happening tonight on these items. Those votes will be at our next meeting and think unless something needs to Okay, but we can take those back to policy too. It's just yeah, my question. Correct. So I know that there's a lot of um, public concern about a couple of them. So I'm going to, I, I don't think with the lateness of the hour, we can't table all of them tonight. So I'm going to ask Mr. Farisi that if there's any that are like pressing, have to be approved, like have to be discussed tonight so we can vote on them in January to kind of prioritize those. So can we, um, I, I don't know what the wording is, but like maybe not go in order of these necessarily. I know that we probably have to talk about public complaints because that's a huge one and library meeting materials tonight. That's a huge one. So if there's any that you could push to the end just in case we run out of time. Does that make sense? I don't know if we're allowed to do that, but that's my suggestion. It, They're not numbered. Just, I'm oh. It does. There are a few that. Um, are based on some legislation that we should try to have a discussion around tonight. So that way, hopefully they could go to the January 11th, I believe meeting uh, for a vote. Um, those would be absolutely the bottom two. Um, and I think maybe truancy is related to that as well. So uh, those three, and if um, the board is comfortable, I could start kind of from the bottom up if that's okay. Uh, okay, yes. I don't know what's best here um, because we, the assumption is you all read the policy. So I guess we would just start with questions or do we need to go over everything again? Um, I, I think because everyone should have read the policies. Beforehand. Everyone did read the policies, but I think it is important to present, present them, yeah. um, present the policy. I think just following um, that procedure would okay. be helpful. We don't need to go in depth with the presentation, but I think it is important to present them. And then second, just follow up. Um, could you just explain which ones are legal? Um, like legislation mandated? Certainly, so in the agenda item F5 uh, that you have in your packet, um, if you were to look at um, the policy 5113.2 truancy and the one right below it, 5144 student discipline. Those would be the two that have legislative mandates connected to them that I would be hopeful I could go over first. Okay, so if we turn to policy 5113.2, truancy. Okay. What you're going to find in this policy um, is the legislative language um, placed immediately in it, which is a, um, a revised definition of attendance. Um, so, uh, what you see here um, is, you know, the new definition of what attendance is um, based on um, a resolution that was passed or adopted uh, containing this update um, on September 7th, 2022. Um, I'll give the board a second to, to take a preview at that. Um, no other changes were made to this policy um, other than on the next page where it's just highlighted the public act that is referenced as well as the resolution. And then we always highlight the to be determined date, which potentially could be January 11th for passing. Any questions on this policy? Oh, okay, thank you. All right. Moving on to uh, student discipline, 5144. Um, if you please flip uh, to page, I believe it is one, two, three, four, five or six, page six in. And what you'll see here is the exact reference taken from Connecticut Public Act number 2247, section 19. And it just really shares how um, any teacher uh, can request a behavior intervention meeting at any time when they feel that there is a need for one based on student behavior. 
And again, that language is taken right from the legislation. Other than that, the only other changes, um, because we had to insert that in, is we just made sure that all of the numbering was accurate. So you'll see a couple of the numbers, the Roman numerals highlighted, and those were updated just to reflect accurately uh, the rest of the policy. And then at the very end of the policy, what we always do is we include the public act, as well as the TBD date of when the policy revision was passed by the board. Any questions, please? Go ahead. Just really quick for the public. If it's in yellow, it's an addition. Like we haven't changed anything, we've just added. Mm -hmm. But if there's crossing out, like we have to like show you what it said before we cross anything out. So just in case the public's looking, this is literally like just an, an insertion, like we just inserted it. So thank you for that clarity. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Miss Yap. Uh, my question is for Mr. Freesey. It says, any teacher may request a behavior intervention meeting. Um, who's included in that meeting? Uh, so each school has a behavior intervention team. Um, and so the behavior intervention team would be a part of that meeting. Are the parents a part of that meeting since it's their child? Um, so there, it depends. At certain points in the process, parents are a part of the meeting. Um, it, at first, it might just be uh, the behavior intervention team that's internal in the school to determine what would need to happen. Parents are absolutely contacted about that, though. From the, from the school. So, so just so I can make sure I'm clarifying that, if a teacher requests a behavior intervention meeting, is the parent notified immediately because that's their child and they're a minor? If it. So if my child, not that example, is if a teacher says, "Well, I think mm -hmm. your child needs a behavior intervention meeting." If as soon as that teacher recommends that, mm -hmm. is the parent notified because it's their child and they should know if something is going on? Right. There's a, a serious, I mean, I, I would just go down to there's a serious disruption and there's self-harm or physical harm. The parent is going to be notified immediately and they would know that there is going to be a meeting to try to support what's going on there. Can we add that in there if that the parent should be notified immediately? Because as a mother, if my child is being seriously disruptive i want to know right away so i can address it as a parent yeah yeah i would just say that that's likely the implementation part of it not the actual policy written this is statute language so we should be prescriptive to the legislation i mean yeah yeah the parent's going to be notified if they're serious as a parent, you I mean, again, it, it, it doesn't say it. it says any teacher may request a behavior intervention meeting for school to the team or any school that lets them free to clarify the team does not include the parent. And just read what I, I and maybe I'm wrong mm -hmm. it, on down below where the highlighted section is on letter D for procedures. It says the parent or guardian of any minor student removed from class shall be given notice of such disciplinary action within 24 hours of the time of the instruction of such removal from class. So I don't know if that's the same. It, it just sounds like that dictates the conversation. So I don't know if I don't know if that alleviates the concern or whatever. But. I think it's Mr. different. Oh, just calling. Yeah, I think it's different. I think those are two separate things. I don't disagree with Ms. Yap that if there's a behavior. And again, like. I'm not I, you know. I was asked at the last meeting to not bring my um, my personal experiences into this, but I, I can't negate the fact that I am an educator by trade. And I do think that letting a parent know that there's a behavior problem. And I think the majority of teachers would do that, but I think it, it just because it's not in legislation, mm -hmm. we can add like that parents will be notified. I guess that's what you're yeah. My point was just usually in legislation, we have to do it as in the legislation. I don't think there is that we have to, I but I mean, I'm just, I'm, I get your point. I just feel like you're, you're being like, you're, you're like kind of saying our teachers wouldn't do that. No, no, I'm just saying, I know they would, and I'm not saying they wouldn't. What I'm saying is it wouldn't hurt to just add it since we already know they would. I wonder if there's an opportunity um, like what you read, uh, Mr. Branda, in, in item D below, if there are a way to recraft that and make an item D in this section, that would uh, better match what this section reads 
um, that would include that. So, uh, Mr. Branda, and just remind there. everybody, let's just make sure we're all making sure we're all heard. Go ahead, Mr. Branda. Yeah, I guess, and I, I get how it's different. I just, I, I guess, for me, when I read it, when I read the two instances that it would be the student would be removed from class if they were causing a serious disruption. So that's why I thought it was the yeah. same. But it, you know, if you spelled out letter D or C, you know, all of those letters underneath there, I think it accomplishes the same thing. It's kind of like a reiteration in my mind. But I, I think the policy as it's written is fine if maybe there's, it's more clear that a student one or two would likely be removed from class and these actions would be taken anyway yeah. but i get it it's just a understand uh mr rosen uh mr laveria i think in keeping with we have to keep the yellow the way it's written because that's what the state mm -hmm. statute yeah, does we can't that. change that but i don't think that it would be a bad idea to add a d that says parents will be notified um i, I know again like I, I don't think it's our district policy it could be who knows but our my school policy where i work is before we bring it to the behavior intervention yep. team, you better have like at least had a conversation with the right. parents. So, uh, uh, and then uh, Mr. Laverrier. All right, I remembered to turn it on this time. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, just for, I mean, when this was in committee, I was brought up questions about like potentially being uh, vagueness of what the definition of serious disruption. But I mean, I've been looking through the definitions that um, it does some, it does, very clearly uh, indicate what a lot of that uh, does include in terms of seriously disruptive educational pro of the process. I mean, but for sub item number 23, throwing snowballs, really? That's a serious disruption. I mean, I think we should take that out. I mean, if somebody, it, it would be incorporated potentially under hazing or bullying, that if somebody was throwing snowballs in a manner that would be hazing or bullying, that, that could be accounted for. But just throwing snowballs, come on, we should take that out. I think, I think just my interpretation is it's not just, I mean, with the exception of like the, the self-harm and um, the altercations, that these are repetitive acts that, that disrupt the class functionality in or outside um, of the building, uh, Ms. Weaver, then Ms. Yap. Yeah, so just wanna let, so the, for those who missed our first committee meeting that we discussed this, I brought up definitions, because for me, I wanna make sure that, you know, we're, what constitutes it. And I think we just kind of have to go back to the intent of what this legislation was, and that's for the benefit of the teachers to be able to have the resource to be able to do that. Um, Beth really explained it well in the committee that oftentimes teachers aren't in other districts, not in our district, right. as was clarified, right. that, the opportunity to enlist the help of a behavior specialist. So the intention of this is really just to be able to have, and I believe the legislation's intent was to be able to have the help uh, available to our teachers because there are many who don't have that ability in other districts. So um, that was to be passed statewide. Um, and I'll just note too that um, I think in the the definitional space of serious disruption, self-harm, and all these other things. Um, we have like the implementation protocol. So this is again where we grapple with policy. Like I understand what you're saying. Like it's one of those things where we can move up like where the definition of serious disruption is. We can move things around to say, okay, we have disruption. Disruption means parent phone call. But some of those I believe also are in student handbook policies too. So those will differentiate by school. Uh, depending on, you know, like which school, again, like as we said with dress code and other things, they're dependent on school and would be in the student policy handbook. So I just want to make sure that's differentiated too. Not saying we shouldn't put that in there, but when we look at policies, they're district wide. So um, some of them may require a phone call to a parent. Some may require, you know, like there's different steps, I think different. Yeah, I, I think it, it, I'm just saying different steps will be taken at different levels, not only for severity of act, but also the level of education in terms of elementary, middle, or high school, depending. Did you have your hand? Yeah, I did. Um, so um, while I respect everyone's opinion, and I, and I, and I do agree with most of the things you're saying, um, I just think that as a mother, and I am getting personal, so I'm going to say it, um, I just like to be contacted, and I'm very in, overly involved, actually, in my own child's life. And if a teacher, you know, we're all individuals, and maybe we all feel 
maybe a teacher would say, okay, I feel comfortable going to the behavioral specialist, but maybe not a parent. I just think it should be, um, and as respect to legislation, I think it should just be in there. And I think it would make sense to just add that piece. I don't know if that's something we can do while we're here, or if it goes back and then comes back. You guys tell me you're better at the procedure than I am. But for me, parental environment is huge. Like that is my child. And at every moment of his life, I need to know what's going on. Sorry, I'm kind of weird like that. But if, especially if there's a way that maybe I as a parent can intervene, if the teacher is having a serious disruption and I can intervene, I don't care what this says. I'm saying that that's my child and I would like to ensure that I'm available. Maybe there's some sort of, you know, help that the parent can give the teacher and like in conjunction with the behavioral specialist from the initial report, not five reports later or three, I don't know how many that is, I'm just making up a number, but I think that having the parent involved from the initial step and initial contact, and I don't ever want it to be assumed that, oh, it means this. No, no, I want to say this because I think that will reassure, reassure a lot of parents as well. Thank you. Um. So really, uh, just to, um. I guess clarify. So that recommendation would go now to policy to be put into policy and then it would come back next time. We would have to wait, I guess. I guess I'd turn that. Yeah. Well, so. yeah, um, we, we have the option if um, we, we can, if we are voting on some other policies as well that evening uh, and we review the revisions and everyone thinks that we should add that to the policies being voted on. We can, we can do that. As an amended, an amendment. Well, I don't well, like, we can just add it because we're not voting. Oh, on oh right, right. I see what you're saying. So got it. And then we're discussing it. If okay. we all, we don't take a vote on it. We're having a discussion. We, and then yeah. it could be voted on in January because he needs this voted on. Okay. I do want to call on Mr. Sharma who has his hand uh, virtually. Hey, just a, just a quick comment. I, I mean, I feel like, especially with like self-harm, um, I think we should put it on the books that the parents should be called because, you know, as a parent, I want, I want to know. So there's nothing wrong in putting that on the books. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yes. I just want to clarify too, like we're talking about all this policy, like Maureen, you can confirm and say like, we are calling parents with those kinds of things. Like, I just want to make sure, I, to make sure I, I understand no, I'm saying it's fine to codify it, but I want to make sure these actions are already being done. Like, we're not saying we don't call parents at that point. For clarity, uh, similar purpose. to what Ms. Rose said, it, it's expected that you are reaching out to parents when their children are having that level of difficulty. Having it in writing just, I think, cements it for us. No problem. So is there anything additional that needs to be brought up for this policy before we move to the next. Okay, we're on to the next one. We're ready. Oh, I thought we were revising this right now. I'm oh. confused. Oh, sorry. I oh, yeah, that's right. Okay, correct. All the we're just adding D. Did you add D and say that the caregivers will be contacted? Okay. Well done. Well done indeed. Okay. So if you are comfortable, Mr. Farisi, may we move to our next to be discussed this evening? <clears throat> yes. Well, that's what I'm trying to, to identify. <laughs> So I would think that the biggest one that most of our constituents are concerned about is the public complaints. That's the one we heard the most about. So we made a lot of, we heard what the public had to say and we made, I think that's probably the Can one we, go we should, go ahead. So I just want to like set the stage for how these two came up first and then um, why there's two different ones. So I think there's a lot of conflation. Just FYI, there's like, are you laughing at me? Like, I'm only laughing because I told Steve we were going to talk. I know. Oh, we did. I didn't say. I didn't say anything to Steve. Um, I, um, so there's two different ones. There's public complaints, and then there's library media material selection. Those are two different ones. And the reason these were brought up was because there was changes um, that were recommended by CABE. Um, and so I think a lot of this, and we discussed this at our, our policy committee meeting. Um, I think there's a very, as is oftentimes uh, the case when you read things without context, there is intent versus impact. And so the intention of this policy recommendation that first came from CAPE is that we're hearing a lot of um, 
understanding what the role of the board is when it comes to complaints and being able to codify uh, some guidance for the public on how to go about that so we can both know us as a role of the board um, and where the best solutions lie for who can go to where. And so there's two different policies. So I don't want to I want to make sure those aren't conflated into the same one because I think um, they are similar but different because one is specific to library and media materials uh, and the other is just um, you know complaint wide um, if there are consider concerns with um, that and uh, setting the stage as we did with our last policy meeting. This is not meant to restrict public or do anything and it's meant to guide them on how best to use the board as an advocacy role as well as the administration, uh, teachers, staff, etc. into how best to get your concerns resolved. We as a board, again, we do not we have three roles as policymakers, budget, and uh, evaluation of superintendent. We are not in the administrative role. So I think this with policy is intention was to just clarify that because I think a lot of times, and we often get, you know, what people come up to the grocery store and be like, hey, I have this concern, you know, and that's more than welcome. We are there to guide people to the correct avenue. So this doesn't limit those, but um, that's the, the spirit of it. Steve, thank you. So Thanks. we're doing the public complaints. Did we do well? We are all set with those. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah, you. Thank you so no. much. We are. Uh, we will go up to, yep, community relations, public complaints. That's policy number 1312. Okay. And I want to thank you for that opening, Ms. Weaver. I do think that um, you used the word welcoming a couple of times in there. And I just would like to point out in the first paragraph that we absolutely do. This um, policy is not to be restrictive whatsoever in having members of the public come and speak to the board. Um, so if you kind of open with it, it does read that we welcome comments and suggestions from the, from citizens. Um, constructive criticism of the school is welcome uh, whenever it is motivated by sincere desire to improve the qualities uh, of the educational program and allow for the schools to do their task more efficiently. So um, really what this is saying is please come and share, share that with us. Um, the board also has confidence in what it's saying in our administrative staff to be able to manage those items that come to our attention. So whether they come to you, um, come here to the to the full board, we want to know about them. Um, whenever a complaint is made uh, directly to the board um, as a whole or as an individual member, um, it will promptly be referred to the appropriate administrative staff to study and possibly find a solution. So that really is our goal and that's the process to it. So our hope is always that when we hear a criticism or a complaint um, that is founded, that we can then direct it to the appropriate uh, staff to be able to solve it. That might be at the building level. Um, that might be in at Dr. Brummett's level. It might be my level, Mrs. Krause's level. Uh, we would have to make that determination and then defer it there. Yes, Ms. Strode. So I just want to, um, there was a couple things that came up from the public and one of them, first I want to say like, this is different than the book selection. So I just want to clarify that those are different because I did hear a member of the public kind of mush them together and they're two very separate policies. But um, one of the things I heard at the last policy meeting was a valid concern from a member of the public saying that they wanted the ability to, for anonymous to be anonymous. I'm not going to make up words because it's too late. Um, anonymous. So I, I don't think there should be anonymous complaints because those get kind of crazy. But I think that the line that says it's in the second paragraph, it says it is important that board members refer persons making complaints. I think that we do need to, I think it's important that the board members let people know about the complaints and I and I again I'm not you know I was also asked by a member of the public not to use my experiences but I had reached out as a board member to Dr. Brumman about a parent who had there was a concern and they had heard this and I, I did not use the name and I said a parent was told this is this true and she, and Dr. Brumman very quickly said no that's not accurate this is accurate and I was able to then go I didn't make any I was just the liaison mm -hmm. and I think it's important that the that the members of the public can 
feel comfortable coming to the board, but I want to make it clear, and I don't know how to put it in wording, that the board doesn't have any say. We can be the liaison and keep it anonymous um, when appropriate. You know, like I did not need to share at that time who that, that parent was who had the question. Um, so I'm wondering if that line should be board members, um, don't refer the person, but like something along the lines of board members, sh board members should contact the appropriate people or refer people to the appropriate people. I, I do think that um, that was one of the more um, poignant concerns that I heard that evening. Um, and I understand that. Or could so, you say refer the situation or re refer the concern? Refer. Yeah, refer the, con right. the concern of the complaint, but I don't think the, yeah. I think you know, like if a person comes up to that. you in the supermarket and has a question or complaint, you as a board member may be able to bring that. I mean, I guess it really kind of depends on what it is, but bring it to wherever it needs to go. Um, and perhaps that individual, that parent does not need an answer back necessarily, but it might be something that needs to be looked into as an issue um separated from the person reporting it um mr laveria and then mr Pratty. thank you um <clears throat> here's the here's the disconnect with um with this proposed policy the first part is saying we welcome having parents come to us that's great however the second part ties the mem the board members hands saying that we can't do anything and I think that is not a good way to go about it. Now, since the policy uh, uh, policy uh, subcommittee meeting, it does appear that um, that point has been addressed somewhat in the second yellow paragraph. In other words, since individual board members have no authority, that part's been removed and the, the word shall had been re uh, removed. Um, I do think that makes a step in the, in the right direction with the policy. However, under the first yellow paragraph, um, where I think that last sentence could be wordsmithed a little bit better because, like I said, it, um, it, 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 it is not the focus of what we've been talking about is the parents coming to the board, but the, the focus should be on what authority a board member has. In other words, does the board member have to say, talk to, uh, Principal Tigno talk to Dr. Brummett and I can't talk to you about it. That's the end of it. And that's a that's a problem. So like So I, I hear what you're saying and I, I did hear that from other members of the public, but I don't I I think I think that that is also a further conversation. Um, I'm gonna use this as as an example. If someone, if a parent comes to us and says, I really feel that elementary school should start earlier at eight o'clock a.m., hypothetical, right? We do not have that power as board members to snap our fingers and do that. We could bring that and say, hey, Dr. Rum, this was brought up. Like, what are your thoughts about this? What's the history behind it? Can we bring it to a board meeting? Can we talk about the time changes? But, that, and I, I could be reading our job obligations wrong, but that is not, there are certain things that are not in our control, right? If somebody says to us, I really need such and such teacher fired, that's not in our sure. job description. I think that there are certain things, like I've been brought, it's several curriculum um, concerns, complaints have been brought to my attention. So I usually tell the parent, like, thank you so much. I'm going to reach back to you in a week, but let me go get more information. It's not that I can't help. I just need to gather more information. So I'll usually right. contact Wendy and Maureen and say, hey, can you give me information about this? Who can I get in touch with? What else do I need to know um, to make to make? Um an informed response so and, and and i do bless you i do i do um understand what you're saying however as the as this is worded exactly it basically ties the hands that a board member can you know theoretically may be restricted from following up with a parent <laughs> yeah and i mean i think that i think that maybe in that last sentence um the, the, Really, the best, the, the last sentence of the first paragraph, I think, should be removed. Um, and alternatively, I think that where it says it will be promptly referred to 
it could maybe say it should promptly be referred to, or it will be promptly brought to the attention of. But I mean, the way it is worded, it does tie the hands of board members that they just theoretically may not be able to follow up with parents. And that is goes against what we're elected for. Um, yeah. Okay, um, Ms. Pratty, Ms. Drills, and then over to Ms. Yap. I don't know if we wanna address that. I had something a little bit different to say just based on the anonymity, anonymity, anonymity. Um, so yeah, and I, I agree with that part in there. And I, I think that there's, you know, Mr. Rose, you said like if a parent has a, a question, I think there's also a difference between questions and complaints, right? So like a question or like, uh, is this happening? is not a complaint, it's a question. And I don't think that this policy is handling questions. Um, I think it's more of like, if someone has an, a serious issue, we as individual board members can't do anything. And we as a board can't do anything unless it's gone through the proper channels. So we don't want a, a complaint that can be addressed in the classroom level to come to the board to like, we. That's not um, our role. So we need to, if it escalates and it can't be resolved in the classroom or can't be resolved in the building, et cetera, up to the, you know, superintendent can't resolve it, then it can come to the board and together we will make a decision, but it, like we can address it. But it's not something that like a complaint from a parent goes immediately to the board. I think that's just want to make sure that everyone's like, like this is not that we're not doing anything. It's that they have to go through um, the right person and we can get questions and we can receive questions and they can be anonymous or they can be whatever. And we can facilitate that, but we are not making decisions and we're not, um, that's yeah. Uh, so I, I don't, agree that this is written in a way that says parents or whoever doesn't have to be parents it could be taxpayers can't reach out and complain about anything to a board member i think parents need to have that that free will even if it's complaining about a parent a, a teacher right that they should have that right to complain to us but we don't have any right we don't have any power or any say to do anything about it so um, I'm going to give another example. I had a someone reach out to me. They were concerned about um, the buses at the high school had shut the doors and wouldn't let someone on the bus, and they were fit to be tied. And they felt comfortable. They knew me as a board member to reach out to me. I reached out to Dr. Brummett. I said, what's going on? What's with this policy? She explained the policy. It's for safety. It's for this. It's to keep the bus from blah, blah, blah. I reached back out to the person. I didn't do anything. I didn't, I didn't have the power to say, that's ridiculous. Open the door. <laughs> but i did absolutely reach back out to that parent and say this is the policy and they said well that's stupid and i go super i go we can certainly look at the policy and bring it up but it, that's what the policy is i'm just letting you know this is the reason why so i don't and and i've had you know the other thing was a, a teacher who had had kind of made a parent she didn't understand what the teacher and and dr Bruma was phenomenal at helping me navigate it i want this policy to reflect that anyone can say anything to us I also want it to reflect that we are just, we don't have this, we don't have any, it's not our role, it's not our job to make any decisions about it. It's our just, it's our role to come back to the board and say, hey, this is a problem, the eight o'clock start time, or it's our, you know, this is a problem, what can we do about it? Da, 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 da. I just, so I don't know, and maybe we need to table this and work on it more after another conversation as a, as a board, but and we probably won't be ready to vote on this next time, but um, I don't want anyone to think that they can't come to us about anything. I just want us to be able to say to them, like, thank you for coming to us. We will follow up. We will go to, and then it's this policy needs to reflect. It's almost a, for us, in a, you know, a board policy to say, once we get that complaint, we need to follow up with the appropriate person. We can't speak for the board. We can't speak as an individual because we're a board. Does that make, I'm babbling. Uh, Ms. Yaplin, Ms. Weaver. 
Um, so I agree with Jones in regards to that. Um, I do think it's not my position that maybe it should go back to the policy committee. I was at, I was one of the members of the public um, at that uh, policy meeting, and some of the things that I heard were they were afraid just by the way it's worded that it restricted uh, their ability to actually come to meetings to speak, um, to voice their opinion. This is what the public was saying at that meeting. So maybe if we could just take a second look um, at this um, and just go over those things because we don't want any members of the public um, and the refu um, just to feel like they can't speak to the Board of Ed. Some of the complaints that you know, I've had, I've called Dr. Brahma and said, hey, is, is this what's going on? Or, you know, and she's quickly, you know, she's always answered the phone and addressed it. So we haven't had any issues, but I just think just to ensure that the public is at ease, if we just kind of go over this again, that would be helpful. Thank you. Ms. Weaver. Yeah, and I think for us, like, I mean, I think it's like the same members of the public tonight, right? Say we, um, even like last night, I think at the town council, people were saying, we have awful mass scores, mass scores went down. I'm complaining about that. And then we come and we say, okay, Dr. Brummett, can we talk about this? I mean, we did talk about it at our last board meeting, um, but like, you know, um, it's one of those things where maybe it's a general complaint, right? Like, I don't like this. Then there's specific complaints as Ms. Rose alluded to, teachers, or I have a teacher. That's not our, I like to say, it's like, this is almost a guide for us where we have to stay in our lane type of deal. This is a guide for us, I think, more so than anything is to say, OK, we as advocates, we are advocates and we are liaisons. Our role, again, budget, review of superintendent and policy making. Those are our three buckets. We do not say we can. You know what? I know you hate that teacher. We're going to fire her I'm like we're done. That's it. It has to go through the chain of command and go through different reviews and all these processes that are at the administrative level. And then we have ultimate oversight of who administers that, Dr. Broman. So I think for us, it's just, like I said, this is an educational policy in, in my view, and I totally understand why that. I mean, for me, my pro perhaps biased view is like, says it in the first sentence, welcomes comments. <laughs> like, to me, it doesn't get more clear than saying welcomes comments. But here's our, uh, I guess, my call to action for others. We absolutely will go and review this again in policy. Please come with specific actual things. I think there's a lot of times where when we're in the policy making process, it's like, and I think the knee jerk reaction to say, I hate this. I don't love it, blah, blah, blah. So for us, we want to be able to incorporate specific changes. So if it doesn't say welcome enough times for someone, if we can add more flowery language to be like, we love you, like bar that, if that makes sense, having specific changes instead of just saying, I think it's bad, it shouldn't go forward, is not useful for us. Um, for us, it, this is what we need is just more specific constructive criticism, because that's what we do to each other in these meetings, and that's how we get better policy. Uh, Ms. Kraft. I did just want to point out, I'm thinking about, Danielle, your example, and that the last sentence in that first paragraph does say, Whenever a complaint is made, it will be promptly referred to the appropriate administration. It doesn't say the person will be referred. So in the examples you are giving, I actually think that is complying with what this is saying here because you referred the issue to Dr. Brummett, but you acted as a liaison. Right, but then in the next the next paragraph, it doesn't say that. So it's almost right. So it's cleaning up all the language throughout and making it clear. Yeah. yeah. So so why do you so one of the recommendations I'm hearing that should go to the policy committee is just to make sure that that consistency of that last sentence in paragraph one is really just the, the theme of paragraph one is seen throughout the rest of the policy. Is that correct? So again, I liked what Jess said, like I had asked at the last policy meeting our two board members who came as public because that's how just Robert's rules go to come with like very specific, um, even if you can email the whole policy in public too. like what are, what's your idea so that we have it um, in front of us. We can kind of look at everything. Um, it's a lot. Those meetings like they're there. There's a lot that's in front of us. It's a lot of words. Um, I had asked for more specific wordsmithing to be done for tonight so that we could actually like 
converse about it rather than kind of be like that line doesn't work that line doesn't work so um doesn't mean that we're necessarily going to put it in but it sure as heck helps us a lot more um rather than just being like we don't like this because it seems wishy-washy great give us some suggestions and then just email it to us the the policy committee and Uh, Mr. Brenda and then Mr. Laveria. So I just wanted to say that I think the intent of this policy is spot on. Um, I know that it took a lot of work just to get to this point, so I do appreciate that. And I think Ms. Weavers, who said it in the beginning, was it also kind of it, it informs the public so that when we had a few people come tonight, they have expectations, they understand what we can and can't do while sitting here. They understand what we can and can't do when they email us, text us, whatever. So, uh, you know, to me, I think the full intent is spot on. Uh, if we're talking about wordsmithing, then I think, you know, again, just send those suggestions to the members of the committee and then have them discuss how to reframe the language. Um, and I, I, but I, I think that the policy is very well written, so. Mr. Laveria. Yes, yeah, so I'm I'm more than happy to just send some, um, you know, an email with my recommendations. Again, I do, I you know, I know we don't want to get repetitive, I know, but just I, I do think that the second paragraph has been cleaned up uh, better, um, but I do think that the first paragraph needs a little more work. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so I would love if we could move on um, to our next policy, which I believe you said was the library materials, if I could be wrong. Uh, it, if we're going to North... Would you prefer to go to that one? Uh, sure. All right. Library media is. I'm going to. I don't know how to do this. Like, I'm going to propose that this is our, if we can, it's already 10 20, and this one's going to be a pretty rich conversation also. Is it going to be okay if this is the last policy that we discussed tonight? We talked about that last time, like moving the other ones to the next. I don't want to mess you up. You will not. Okay. Thank you. It's it's policy sixty one sixty one point one. Library media center material selection, and that was a recommendation that was added. Uh, so it was clear what we were speaking about. Um, and what you'll see here um, are some revisions. Uh, I think we've actually already went over and shared some of these revisions that we made um, and we started a discussion on this one. Um, so you'll just see that um, instead of the vagueness of uh, appropriateness, we just talked about a librarian, uh, library media specialist would consider age. That's what you see in the change of number five. Um, again, they already do this. That would just be a clarification of language. And then in the paragraph toward the, the bottom, um, we just referenced back up to uh, the five criteria um, because those are important and we wanted to make sure that was clarified um, and just added some greater clarification based on feedback from our, our library media specialists. Just in all cases, a decision uh, to retain or reject shall be made on the basis of whether the materials represents life in its true proportions, whether circumstances are realistically dealt with, and whether the material has literary or social value. Um, and then we refer back to the complaints policy, and that's the connection to this. Uh, Ms. Weaver, the yeah, I just wanted to clarify too. Um, we had a very robust discussion about the subjectivity of appropriate, um, mm -hmm. because it came up, you know, in all other forms of policy and other things. Um, I think we all have a different view of what appropriate is. What Ms. Rose would think is appropriate may not be what I think is appropriate. May not be what Ms. Wagner thinks is appropriate. So we thought best to take out a lot of the subjectivity and be able to then add what the actual criterion is, which is the five uh, up there. So just if anyone has clarification on that, I think we all have different views on what that means. Yeah. Um, so I was going to suggest something um, in the future. So I have two things to say, sorry. Um, so when finance and facilities come sometimes work hand in hand, so we have our meetings joint. So with something like this, and we have a curriculum committee, I would think that it would make sense for the curriculum committee to meet with policy on something like this, if there ever is anything like this coming up in the future, not saying to go back, but moving forward, because these are some of the things we we also 
yeah, we also discussed, sorry, it's kind of the same people like finance um, discussed together. Um, one of the things that I am advocating for is um, under the five criteria, if a parent, and this is just a question, um, doesn't agree, and maybe this question is for Wendy, she might uh, know better, um, doesn't agree with the material um, that their child is reading and says, you know, um, although this may be uh, adhere to the five criteria outlined, uh, this doesn't um, go with my religious beliefs or my uh, cultural beliefs. So what do you say to that? So if I'm a parent and you have a book and yes, it might, it might meet this criteria, but it maybe doesn't work with my religious or cultural beliefs. So then what's the next step? Yeah, and these, this um, policy talking about the books and if we're speaking specifically about the media center, no child is required to read any book. So it's it's considered voluntary reading. So they have access to books. They're not required to read them. So the answer would be they don't have to read it. Okay. And so this is just the media I I think that's what the committee talked about. I I do wonder about that because um, I've been asked about, and the curriculum committee has looked at our text selection guidelines, which are drawn from this policy. So you'll see the language is almost identical. We that and that's not a policy. It's just how we conduct business. But if you read this policy through, everything here applies to any materials we pick. So if you go back and reread the original title, library media material selection, I do wonder with the definition that they have there, are they referring just to library media materials, not materials that we put in our library media center? Yeah. So then what I'm hearing is the potential consideration of the word center in there is too limiting for this policy and that this would be inclusive of any library media resource materials that would be purchased throughout I bring the it up too because I'm right. I, this was originally written in 2001. I don't even think we called it library media center. I think the policy was actually written around library media materials. We just rena renamed our libraries to library media centers. Um, and then later in the policy, it does refer to the purchase of materials for each program is subject to the approval by the appropriate administrator, which seems to me like it's talking about different programs too, but I can't be sure of what, what the intent was in 2001. And that might cover some of the more broader concerns that we hear sometimes about how are, how are classroom library materials selected, and this would cover that as well. So it might be better to leave it more open without the word center in it. Just just want to so clarify. Um, yes. Yeah. Barrier and then Ms. Pratty. Just want to clarify, this was an edit that Ms. Yop suggested that we put because she wanted to differentiate between the library center and the library classroom, the classroom libraries. So it was suggested we, we took this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I, until she just said it's the same for the curriculum. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep. I didn't realize that. It, understood. Yeah. Oh. So, so what we and we kind of went back and forth on this is just the differentiation between them because we do have technically, like I think, a separate policy on text selection. It it is, but it's a different policy number because it's technically different material. If that makes sense, like you know what I'm saying. It, it's not, and also like she said, it's in-house business. Like there's is, we don't have a district-wide policy on text selection because that's under curriculum, I believe. Mr. Fursi can correct me, but the the policy is on the district wide things right not subject to program specific which is why that's under wendy if that's making sense and then the district wide policy is for what we were saying is um for the library media centers within the school so they may have uh the same verbiage but they're not talking about the same subject matter if that makes sense so i think that's why we just they're separate uh, it, even though they're the same yeah uh, Mr. Laveria. Yeah, uh, very briefly, and thanks. Um, I mean, when it comes to um, materials that are available in a library at a school or at a public library, I mean, there are significant First uh, Amendment uh, rights. And, you know, while I respect um, any parent's um, wishes or to make sure that their religious beliefs, et cetera, um, closely held personal beliefs um, are, um, you know, being uh, honored when it comes to their child's education, the library materials are different. 
it's a, it it is a, it is a safe haven for free speech and to a degree um if a parent has a complaint about it if their kid wants to go pick a book out of the library that's that's what schools are for that's what libraries are for um and i take that back that's not what schools are for that's what libraries are for yeah. okay um so i mean you know when it comes to you know what books are going into a classroom i mean that's obviously under the purview of the curriculum committee but i mean i i do support this as it is i think too I think too, um, uh, Ms. Cross brought up, she did extensive research and even looked at numerous case studies involving this to your point, Mr. Larrier, and, it, and, it, and many of them did talk about um, how though a parent may voice that this is not the right book for their child, that their desire for their child not to read that book could not impact other students' right to access that book should they choose to do so. So point well made. Uh, Ms. Peratti. Thank you. I'm um, just going back to the title. I also had a question on that, um, whether center was appropriate to put in there. And the definition right below it says that materials are defined as educational materials other than textbooks and workbooks. So a um, educational material like a book that's read in class like a you know ELA book would fall under this and not necessarily be a media center book, mm -hmm. right? So I think that um, I don't think that the word center belongs in there. And if there is another, I don't think there's a, another one that fills the gap. So I just want to make sure we're not limiting the policy um, to media center if it really is going to be more than just the media center. Mr. Rose, the question I'd have is, um, I know that the question that came to us as the policy committee was the idea of the classroom library. And I don't know, and I, I'm not a lawyer, and I know that somebody might have some knowledge of that. Um, a library gives you what you said, the access to the books. Is there a difference a differentiation, and I don't think there is, but a differentiation between a library and a classroom, right? So I, I used to have the library and just drop off a bunch of books when I used to have SSR back in the day when that was delightful and I miss those times. Um, and so the kids that didn't have a book, they had library books to choose from, but they were in my classroom library. So do we need to put something in there that we're talking library, whether from the media or from a classroom library, is this we're not talking about ela books i'm not talking about we're all going to read you know right. um yeah. bridge to terabithia and cry a lot we're we're talking about those books that are in our classrooms mr branda i guess i would just wonder how those books would be selected because my understanding would be that they would be in collaboration with the library itself so yeah so the library media materials selection would qualify for the classroom as well in my mind the way i read this was it's all libraries within the the school itself as a library as go get a book and read it and like wendy said your free time or whatever not we're going to read this text and do a lesson on it specifically it's not a and central every, text exactly. it's a it's a free choice uh yes miss yeah no problem it looks like i know when my son was to patterson they could order from that class thing um, there's a bunch of books on there. Are they allowed to put those in the classroom? Mm -hmm. Yes. So do they have to go through a vetting process or are they just put a classroom in? Uh, Ms. Krauss. The teachers are permitted to purchase books from vetted vendors. So in Scholastic is one of them. So, um, and I've talked to Dr. Brummett too about um, bringing uh, somebody to the board to discuss this topic further to be educated in the way that I was over this, the research I did. Um, and I think it would be really helpful. Uh, one of the things that those vendors do is they use a professional standard. And that is, um, that means that people who are highly trained and skilled to look at books and determine what the appropriateness to that term that you were referring to earlier, there are standards to do that. So us, us as a group of people, we could all have a different opinion about a book being appropriate for, for our child or ourselves. 
Um, so they use a professional standard for that. So and if those vendors are doing that and teachers follow their recommendations, they are permitted to do that. But that school has to vote because I borrowed your time with our school is most of just doing a lot. Um, there's an age range. But like correct high school first class six, let's say and I'm sure I have them but I do it all the time. Um, and that scholastic pamphlet that you guys all know about, those aren't just for preschool, even though it was given to my preschool. Correct. So some of those books could be for fifth grade, right? So if the teacher goes, I really love this book and it's put in my preschool classroom. Is that inappropriate? And who, who decides that? Yeah, yes. you're actually making a good point of the difference between what the curated resources in a library media center versus a classroom library. The classroom teacher actually takes that big collection and curates the down to this is what's appropriate in my classroom for the age group that I have here. Student who goes to the library media center has access to a broader range of books. When they're in the classroom, the teacher is selecting books appropriate for that for that classroom. So the parent doesn't feel that that book is appropriate. Can they opt out? Yes. Oh. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. We actually ask parents to if a parent were to let a teacher know certain books that they're not comfortable with their child accessing, then that's done through the teacher and the parent. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mr. Okay, so policy committee back to this. So other than taking out center, mm -hmm. is there any other like feedback that we need to change this policy or can it go to vote the next meeting? It's like everyone cool with that so we can it's I'm not I'm not hearing otherwise. So I would say that it can move to vote. So I think that oops, I turned the mic off. I think that we had discussed that this was gonna be our last policy to discuss discuss this evening. Um, so I just want to make sure I'm super clear. That means that for our January meeting, we are moving the standing committee's policy, the truancy policy, the admission non-resident students policy. No, no not yet. But that, I mean, like that's discussion, I guess. The, um, that would be discussion points. That would go to be talked about, to be discussed, to be presented and discussed. Does that make sense? Not an action item, but question item. Correct. The discussion item. So the action items for the next meeting would be truancy, yep. student discipline, mm -hmm. and library media materials selection. Those are the only three that we're ready to vote on. Three are ready. Okay. Um, all right. So that ends our new business for this evening. I'm going to move on to our public participation on any matter related to board responsibilities in person via telephone or online with us. And civil participation is limited to um, three minutes. And I just want to interject since I'm sitting in this seat tonight that a suggestion was made earlier um, about um, the, uh, during town council meetings, there is a time when Counselors can respond to public's comments and a suggestion was made that 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 this board look at that. So I would ask possibly in the future if I think policy committee could ponder that and look. Yeah, because they don't have anything to do. Um, no, but but it was. It, yeah, so or maybe it comes to this board. I'm not sure. I think it was a very valid, valid, well made point. Um, and so I think it'd be important to kind of research it and look perhaps look into it one way or another um since it was a valid point brought to our table so at this point um if you would like to participate like i said online please raise your hand or feel free to call the number which That's is 860-665-8659 i'm sorry i can't see it I didn't hear any hands going. Where do you see that? Yeah. Okay. So no hands online. Okay, so I don't see any hands online. I will start with um board member kind of wrap up comments, but if somebody from the public didn't hear or needs to address that, they will. I will start with Mr. Branda and go around. Well, I didn't really have anything. So 
uh, we won't see each other until January. And I know everybody's super bummed about that. And I know Danielle is going to miss me the most. But um, enjoy your holidays. Enjoy your break. Teachers, take that time, please. And hopefully reset. Do something. Do something for yourself. Oh. Um, I was going to say happy holidays to everyone. And, you know, today's the anniversary of Sandy Hook. So I wanted to remember all the children that, you know, wouldn't be able to celebrate um, Christmas with their families. Um, someone I knew personally was affected by that. So um, that's dear to me. Um, but I want to say happy holidays. And I hope you guys all have a wonderful holiday that you celebrate. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to echo that. I was. I was literally going to say, no, no, no it, it's good that we all have it on our minds today. I think it's one of the things um, we should all be thinking about. Um, and uh, just wanted to, again, congratulate all of those in the beginning of the meeting. That was four hours ago, but <laughs> wanted to say congratulations to our holiday contest winners, as well as, again, our everyday heroes. Um, good reflection of the district. And uh, thank you all for the constructive dialogue we have. This is exactly what we look for in policy. So I appreciate your input um, and look forward to more uh, in the new year. So thank you. Um, yeah, uh, 10 years ago, we did have uh, the worst tragedy in the history of our state. Um, and I don't, what I want to, I guess this is a rhetorical question here um, to a degree, but it's, you know, who's committing these types of atrocities that are going on across uh, the country. It is young men, typically age 17 to 20. Um, and I, this is where the rhetorical question comes in. What are we doing from like a pedagogical uh, perspective to make sure that we are uh, ensuring that our young men age 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 are getting the appropriate social emotional learning and unfortunately it is something that from every anecdote that i've seen has been um you know amongst our young men who clearly have problems and you know maybe that's something that we should reflect on at least for the time being um what can we do better to make sure it never happens here thanks um, I just want to say a quick thanks to the policy committee. I know Danielle mentioned a couple times that um, during the last committee meeting, um, somebody said that you shouldn't bring personal experiences, but I think that's really what makes the board good um, in general, as we all are coming from a different place and we all have experiences. And so I just appreciate the three of you, especially for bringing your experiences to the policies and i know that you all care deeply and spend a lot of time going through it and we think you know we've had to push policies from one agenda to the next multiple times um and and that's just you know how much more are you spending doing that so i just want to say thank you and i appreciate everybody's experiences um because they're all different and we're all um bringing what we have to this board. So um, happy new year, happy holidays, and I will see everyone in January. I wanna, I, I'm not gonna repeat everything, but I wanna reiterate that I really appreciate the conversation tonight. It was like a uh, first time in a long time that I felt like this was like, there wasn't a lot of hostility and there was like good conversation and um, the conversations were light and fluffy and then just like snow. So I wish you all. Um, so I wish you all safety on Friday with the pending snow and happy holidays and have a safe and happy new year. And Mr. Bird, I hope to see you over break. Well, that'll be interesting. Um, just want to say again, just echo Sam. Oh, oh, uh, yeah. I'll, I, yes, I will go to, yes, yes. Um, just wanted to say, again, happy holidays, happy new year. Use that time to do something wonderful for yourself. I think that self-care is super important. I myself stink at it, but need to do better because I think it's really important. Um, and I'm sure that there are no teachers listening right now because I hope they're getting some good sleep because these are interesting weeks as a teacher our little loves are very riled up ready for excitement um so i hope that all of our teachers that do hear this just thank you for for all that you do especially um 
keeping the the Sandy Hook tragedy um, in mind. So many teachers that day put put themselves in front of children, and a, a, as we do, that's just what you do. Um, and also thank you to Dr. Permit and your staff who at 1043 are sitting here as well. And I know um, several of you have been with, you know, I think like 530, I think we were here, Mr. Parisi. I feel like I've been here all day. Um, so thank you. And uh, Sam, I'm going to lead it to you and then to Dr. Brummett. Hi, I just want to wish everyone, uh, you know, Merry Christmas, um, Happy Holidays and Happy New Year, especially the support staff, especially like the custodians, the drivers, you know, that's, and they, they keep us going. So, you know, everyone like have a, you know, have a safe holiday and thanks a lot. And I appreciate everyone. And I would like to wish everyone a happy holiday, enjoy the pumpkin bread, and I'd like to give our chairman tonight a round of applause. Last minute insertion, and she rallied and did a fantastic job. So awesome. With that and motion to adjourn. I beat you. You were on, your mic wasn't on. Oh. It was too long. Second then. Yes. Oh, that is lovely. <laughs> Might need that in my classroom. Sit <laughs> that after a while. Oh. <laughs> Jessica, yeah. did we try to get a quick date on the books? Yeah. Just because I worry yeah. January 11th is going to come quick. Yeah. Oh, you know it. Yeah. I don't even know if like Monday or Tuesday. Yeah. 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 I said that on the board. Why? Why do you think that? Are you like, what? Yeah. Yeah.